Okay, we good for streaming? Thanks, Chrishell. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our special planning committee meeting. This is June the 20th, and I am calling this to order at 9.01 a.m. Uh, I am verbally confirming that we have quorum. Uh, Councillor Mazan sends her regrets, and I believe that Councillor Nishikawa will be here shortly. And do I see Councillor Hayes? She, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Hayes. All right. And I, I um, actually uh, verbally uh, confirm that the CAO, Clerk, Director of Development Services and Environmental Sustainability and other members of staff are present. So uh, input was asked for through planning at muskokalakes.ca. Uh, today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka Lakes website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. We do have a supplementary uh, agenda today, uh, and I'm going to read the list of people who will have two minutes to speak to us. Don Byrne, Joanne uh, Rusnell, Bruce McNeely, Jana Corrigan, uh, Nancy Braun, Rob uh, Liebetter, Monique Newman, Andrea Frey, Gary Lintern, Eric Morgan, and Laurie Simon. Okay, so my next, uh, um, my next task is to ask if there is any declaration of uh, pecuniary interest. All right, seeing none, I am going to, um, I'm going to welcome Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond into uh, into the meeting. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, they are our consultants who are helping us put together our new official plan. So this morning, Hi. yeah, welcome. Uh, so this morning, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Pink just to give a very brief update before we start our delegations. And the way we're gonna, we have many, many people delegating today. So. We're going to bring in our, fifth, our 12 delegates who can delegate for five minutes each. We're going to bring them in as one, and this is partly for them to hear. Please leave your camera uh, off on, and muted until um, I call your name, and then you'll have five minutes. I would ask that if your points that you want to make have already been made, if you could briefly acknowledge that uh, rather than repeat what's already been said. And then once uh, you've finished your delegation, if um, anybody on council has any questions from a particular delegate, please step in at that point because we will move those delegates back out of the meeting once they have finished. Um, the other thing, councillors, in terms of uh, coordinating this going forward, I would ask that you all um, decide what you want to talk about once we are finished this. Mr. McDonald has provided us with a summary of the updates from our last uh, from our last OP. I'm going to start with the assumption that anything that hasn't been changed from the last OP, we are basically agreeing to. So if you want something to be reopened, please let me know. And then if I'm going to ask you to submit to me the, the, the areas that you would like to have discussed. I think that's the easiest way to do it this time. That won't happen today, but um, if you could do that for me after we finish with the delegations, uh, perhaps later today before we get to our meeting tomorrow. So I think that's the end of my sort of um, um, details on what's going to happen this morning. And perhaps, Mr. Pink, you could give us just a quick update. And while you're just doing that, uh, Chriselle, maybe you can bring our delegates in. Thank you. And good morning, committee, uh, members of the community and staff. Um, uh, committee, you have before you the third draft of the official plan. Draft official plan, I'm pleased to uh, present to you. Uh, as you all know, we've been working uh, uh, through this project for a number of years now and a number of revisions uh, and drafts. Most recently, uh, we had uh, several open houses uh, and an online survey uh, over the last fall and winter. And we returned earlier this year to receive direction uh, and update committee on the input received through those processes. And what you have before you uh, is the result of those changes and direction received. Uh, Mr. McDonald has prepared a very uh, detailed memo uh, outlining those changes based on the submissions and comments we've received and instructions from uh, committee. Uh, 
uh, in order to produce that third draft. What we're looking for is a result of this series of meetings. It's hopefully uh, agreement to circulate this uh, third draft to the public and agencies and stakeholders uh, in order to host a, the statutory open house and public meeting later this summer. And with that, I look forward to the upcoming discussions and the delegations that we're hearing today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, our first delegate is Mr. Pato. Welcome, Frank. Hi, uh, thank you, Chair Bridgman. And, and again, just let me say thank you for your service to our community. I saw an announcement that you're not gonna stand for re-election. I implore you to reconsider your decision because you've just been a tremendous asset. And I'd also like to thank All On Committee for your work here. Uh, I don't want to spend five minutes thanking people, but I am incredibly grateful for the work of the planning committee on the OP. And I also don't want to disparage anybody in the community, but I don't think it's appropriate for uh, members who are on this planning committee to be running ads in major publications, disparaging the work of the committee or calling into question some of the deliberations outside of the private context of the uh, committee's work. And again, I don't want to point fingers at anybody, but uh, having served on the Minette committee, I was very careful not to do that. And uh, I don't think that sort of whoever's got the loudest voice should be the ones uh, badgering um, members of council in these decisions. And, you know, one of the things I read in one of these advertisements is that resident, uh, recreational carrying capacity is not based on science. I, I don't believe that's true. And I'm not here to pound the sand on re uh, recreational carrying capacity, but I also think it's not true that it just got pulled out of the air and it's not based on science. So I've made my comments before about how boats traveling at speed can travel through a uh, couple of hectares of recreational carrying capacity in just a few sections, seconds. I think that is an important safety issue, but I also think it has to do with the science of geometry. Frankly, we already have restrictions on lot creation and we're addressing it in this new OP based on lot frontage. And frankly, uh, you can relate the perimeter of any area uh, to the area inside that perimeter. And um, I don't wanna get deep into math, but you know, a circle has the highest ratio of area to perimeter. Whereas a shape like a star, for example, uh, has three times the amount of perimeter for the same surface area as a circle. And so when you think about things like recreational carrying capacity, I do think one of the reasons behind the science is that perimeter restrictions, lot frontage for perimeter alone, do not take into account things like the irregularity of uh, lake frontage surface. And so is it fair that somebody who lives on a star-shaped lake uh, is allowed three times the number of lots as somebody who lives on a round lake if the lakes have the exact same surface area? I do think that recreational carrying capacity, part of the science behind recreational carrying capacity is to address those inherent issue, issues of fairness. I think that um, recreational carrying capacity is a good tool. I think it should be applied equally to all I think it should be applied to the large lake, as well as the small lakes, uh, particularly large lakes where there's constricted bays. So um, I, I don't want to spend all my time talking about recreational carrying capacity, but I do think it's important for members of this committee to not be overly swayed by people taking out ads and publications saying that recreational carrying capacity is not based on science. I personally don't believe that's true. I think there is judgment in these things, but that's what you guys are supposed to be doing is applying judgment. My second point is about the restrictions on um, land access and the requirements for islanders to uh, have uh, contractual access to landings. And I applaud Mr. McDonald for the work he's done. And I know he's gonna speak after me. I was hoping he'd speak before me so I could speak more directly to his comments on the work he's done here. But my concern is that this still reads as very restrictive to islanders. And my broader comment is, you know, islanders pay the exact same tax rates as mainland properties. There's already restrictions on Islanders in terms of our ability to create lots requiring greater frontage than mainland properties. There's restrictions on you know, uh, setbacks with greater onus on Islanders. And my concern is if we're now gonna put additional requirements on effectively whether it's deeded access or a contractual right that has to sell with the property, that means getting a mainland property owner to put a lien on their property, which impairs the value of their property, that's a pretty restrictive ask. And it's gonna be hard to come by and hard to comply with. And if we're really trying to solve for mainland parking, again, I implore this committee to address the issue straight on mainland parking rather than further restricting the property rights of Islanders 
who pay the same taxes as everybody else. Now, if we were going to be charged a tax rate like forest lands, who also have restricted light rights on development, but they pay half the taxes, then I could understand that. But if we're going to continue to pay the same taxes as everybody else, I don't see why islanders have to be so much more restricted than everybody else. And if the real issue is parking, I implore this committee, I, I like the idea of having a contractual right where the islander agrees to create a new property that they won't park on the land. So that's an enforceable right of the township. I think that's a good requirement. But I think the requirement to force you to buy something on the mainland or enter a contractual property right with someone on the mainland, it's going to be hard to come by because you're going to restrict the rights of their property in perpetuity. I think that's a very onerous requirement on islanders who've done nothing wrong. If we haven't broken the law, we've not parked on the mainland. Why are we being punished? Why are our property rights being so restricted and our values being impaired so much? I encourage you to think about things like escalating um, fines for repeat offenders on parking. You know, maybe the fine should go up dramatically for second, third, and subsequent uh, uh, infractions. So I'll let you go with that, but those are my two major comments. I, I think it's unfair to disparage recreational carrying capacity out of hand as being unscientific. I take issue with that. And I think it's also unfair to keep piling on the Islanders. And I don't think, I, I think it's just a little bit of adding insult to injury. I don't think it needs to be quite this restrictive on the parking point on the lot creation side in particular. And with that, I yield and say thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Pato. Do, do any councillors have any questions or comments? Okay, so thank you very much. Um, we're gonna move Mr. Pato out of the meeting at this point and invite Mr. Richards to turn on his camera. Is he here? I'm not seeing him on my screen. Okay, so we are not seeing Mr. Richards. If he appears before we finish with this, we'll, we'll let him in. Um, our next one is uh, Ms. Thompson, Lori Thompson. Welcome, Ms. Thompson. Good morning, everyone. Good Thank morning. you for allowing me. Can you hear go me? Ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. My name is Lori Thompson, and I live at 89 Binsgarth Road in Toronto. I'm president of Friends of Muskoka, and I speak to you today on behalf of this organization. <laughs> I'd like to thank members of committee, consultants, and planning staff for your work on this OP review to date. It has truly been a gargantuan task. Uh, Friends of Muskoka is very pleased to see a good number of our recommendations incorporated into the most recent draft document, particularly in the commercial accommodation section and the policies related to environment, natural heritage, climate change, and measuring cumulative impacts. There are, however, a few additional changes that we believe will strengthen the OP and will get and we will get those to you in a, a, a letter, a much, much shorter version than last time, very, very soon. Um, but I'd like to highlight five of those today. The first is estate lots in rural areas. Section H2.1.2K states that estate residential development of 20 lots or less may be considered by way of an OPA. However, the provincial policy statement directs the majority of growth in municipalities to serviced urban areas and allows for only limited residential development in rural areas. Similarly, the District of, District of Muskoka official plan permits limited rural growth and also directs most growth to the serviced urban areas. In TML, those areas would be Bala and Port Carling and to a lesser extent, other community areas which are unserviced at this time. Furthermore, the district forecasts that 300 new permanent homes will be required in TML over a 20 year period. The district plan has targeted 70% of this growth to the urban and community areas, which leaves about 80 new permanent dwellings in total for rural and shoreline areas or four new homes per year. Also, the Muskoka OP, the district OP requires that rural lot creation consider, among other things, avoidance of further fragmentation of large intact natural areas and appropriate access to things like employment schools, community facilities, services, and amenities. So we do not see how opening the window to rural estate development is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the Muskoka OP, or growth targets for the region. It's also not consistent with the latest thinking on building sustainable communities, which directs that new development be located near existing development in serviced areas with access to all of the amenities that I've mentioned before. My second point is development on very small islands. The existing OP 
requires an environmental impact study for development on islands slightly less than 0.8 hectares. And we recommend that this EIS requirement be carried forward into this OP as well because of the special concerns when very small islands are developed, including visual impact, environmental impact, access and provision of services. Our third point is down zoning of marinas in section E4.8. Given the importance of marina operations to the township, we repeat our suggestion that any application to down zone or rezone a marina should only occur at the time of a comprehensive review or some other township wide planning process such as the transportation master plan process. Fourth point also concerns marinas in section E4.8, and that's the siting of them. And we request that new marinas not be located in shallow bays or wetlands, given the environmental damage this would cause. Last point uh, is recreational carrying capacity, section E9. We support the submission that you will hear from the Muskoka Small Lakes Coalition requesting that RCC be a hard cap on creation of new lots on small and medium sized lakes. Applying RCC as a hard cap is consistent with the precautionary approach we are, talking to, we are taking to development throughout this official plan. It's been argued that RCC is not scientific. Uh, the OMB decision upholding Segwin's RCC specifically noted that it is scientific. Uh, in fact, as, as Mr. Potter just pointed out, it has a basis in models used for boating safety analysis, and it's been used um, by many municipalities as a proxy for shoreline overdevelopment. Just like 300 foot frontages feels right on larger lakes, the RCC restriction of one lot per 1.6 hectare of water surface is experienced, is experienced as the point at which smaller and narrower water bodies feel overdeveloped. Uh, regardless, many planning tools such as maximum lot coverage and minimum lot frontage are not scientific, but are accepted as precautionary tools to put specific limits on development, thereby preventing overdevelopment, just as we believe RCC should be used. And while permitting lot creation on lakes where RCC has been surpassed subject to conditions may sound like a balanced compromise approach, it's not. It's like saying you need to have 200 to 300 feet of frontage for new lot creation but we will make exceptions if you site your cottage in a certain place or decrease the size of your dock. Ms. Thompson, you're a little over five minutes at this okay. point. So could we wrap it up, please? I will. Okay. Just one very quick point. The wording as it is in this draft will make it very difficult for council to refuse any applications to create new locks, lots on lakes that are over their RCC limit. Council can set criteria for building. But these hey, Ms. Like, Thompson, like I'm appealing. sorry, okay. but I'm, I have Thank to you. be really tough okay. today because we have so many people. Okay, thank you very much. Please consider RCC as a hard cap. Oh, you got it in. Okay, thank, thanks very much. Any questions, councillors? Nope. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Pierce is up next. Welcome, Mr. Pierce. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Bridgman, councillors and staff. Uh, as uh, Laurie Thompson mentioned, uh, good progress on commercial accommodation section, part F. Uh, three comments, uh, no resorts on islands uh, as per the current official plan. Uh, we again request that uh, this be added uh, back in uh, as it's currently in the official plan now. Uh, it was in our suggested wording in the March submission uh, where it said meet the following minimum lot and siting requirements on a mainland property, so therefore not on an island, uh, a lot area of two hectares and a water frontage of 150 meters. Uh, we don't want another Langmaid's Island uh, like Lake of Bays, uh, nor resorts on islands has been a long established policy in the township. Uh, this would create numerous issues such as mainland parking that we just heard from Frank Pato, don't wanna increase that issue, boat slips and boat traffic uh, and septic concerns. Uh, there's something like 27 kilometers of shoreline available for resorts. Uh, similarly, a resort should not be on a small property with limited shoreline. Uh, and that's the uh, current OP uh, section B11.16. Uh, resorts ceasing to carry on business. Uh, Meridian suggested that when a resort ceases to carry on business, uh, the uh, unit owners should not be precluded from using their units uh, and that they may operate the resort themselves uh, but they cannot convert them to residential use. The current official plan uh, says goes on to say that the units are unable to be operated as part of a resort. Uh, use of the units shall cease until it is possible to operate them as such. 
we suggest that this go back in, otherwise it becomes residential by default. Uh, either that or they shall operate it as resort and if they don't, they can't use their unit. I recognize that unit owners may not be able to operate a restaurant, etc. cetera, uh, but uh, I believe that they can operate a commercial condo uh, by operating a rental program. I think that's the key consideration. If they don't run a rental program, a uh, mandatory rental program, run by the condo corp, uh, then they shouldn't be able to use their unit. Uh, the uh, owner developer won't be in the picture and it's just the condo corp. And as I say, it must be a commercial condo corp, not a residential condo. That's what the OP currently says. My third point is uh, unit owners uh, being able to use their unit up to 100% when the unit is not rented. Uh, I acknowledge that uh, it's now been uh, specified at 75%. Uh, with a unit uh, being in a rental pool at least 26 weeks per year, arguably it's 50-50. Uh, it's not commercial or residential. The predominant use is neither one nor the other. However, at some point you reach a tipping point. I think we saw quite clearly that 10 weeks in a rental pool is not sufficient to be considered commercial uh, with 42 weeks exclusive owner usage. Uh, a provision has been added to permit a unit uh, owner to use their unit when it's not rented, and that's fair enough. Uh, however, without some limitation, if that were the case, it could potentially be used up to 100% of the time. Uh, we had suggested a maximum, but we didn't put in a number. Uh, our fault, maybe. Uh, Meridian has suggested 39 weeks or 75%, so splitting the baby. Effectively, uh, uh, I suggest that's still too much. It's only three weeks shy of the 42 weeks, which we found uh, uh, problematic. Uh, it's a long way from 50-50. Uh, the problem is hot Friday Harbor, and that's where they had uh, 60 days that it had to be uh, owned. Uh, the owner could not use it. So people were saying it was a hardship to have to move out and stay with friends or family. And they successfully lobbied that it should be uh, allowed to be completely residential, which I think is not the intent here. Uh, and those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pierce. Uh, committee, anybody have any questions of Mr. Pierce? Okay, thank you, Mr. Pierce. Uh, now we have Mr. Scarrow. All right. And I believe, Mr. Scarrow, good morning. And Mr. Uh, Roasek, I know you have a presentation you're going to split, I believe. So. So, okay, so please just your name and address. I think you know the routine and, and uh, are we, we're uploading that for you, are we? There we go. Okay, please, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Let me just get my notes in front of me here. Uh, good morning, Chair, uh, Chair Bridgman and members of the committee. My name is Mark Scarrow. I reside at 1250 Land Lake Road 2 in Milford Bay. I'm here today on behalf of the Muskoka Lakes, uh, the Sm Muskoka Small Lakes Coalition. It's a coalition of five smaller lakes in the township, uh, being Three Mile Lake, Brandy Lake, Camel Lake, Leonard Lake, and Skeleton Lake. And we're here to make the case for the adoption of recreational carrying capacity as a hard cap for small lakes in the township. Uh, next slide. We know about the finite resources in terms of the number of lakes, the finite water surface area, the shoreline perimeter, the water volume, the finite capacity to sustain development, et cetera. More development equals more lake surface usage. And the intensity of usage is higher per dwelling now than it was 50 years ago, bigger boats, faster boats. And we, I think, need to acknowledge that there is a finite amount of use that a lake can sustain. And that after 100 years plus of development, some lakes may have actually reached their development and recreational capacity. Uh, next slide. The current planning approach does deploy different development and land use policies between the three categories of lakes, and this is entirely appropriate. Different lakes, uh, different policies. However, the current policy uses waterfront lot frontage as the sole factor to determine if new lots can be created, regardless of the category of lake or other lake characteristics. And the question is, is a policy that only uses lot frontage to create new lots fair and equitable to all lakes? We make the case that the answer to this important question is no. Uh, next slide, please. What we're gonna do is look at geometry, size, and lake characteristics to see how these factors present challenges and opportunities in a capacity discussion. 
and how recreational carrying capacity or RCC actually accommodates the challenges. Uh, next slide. Hopefully you're looking at a slide that has the chart on it. So the chart illustrates the number of hectares of water surface area for every one kilometer of shoreline. It shows the three category one lakes and a selection of category two and three lakes. The tall blue bars exclude the island perimeter and the green shorter bars factor in the island perimeter. So for example, Lake Muskoka has 45 hectares of water surface area for each one kilometer of shoreline perimeter or 31 and a half hectares if you factor in the islands for each kilometer shoreline perimeter. And you compare that to say 10 hectares of surface area for every kilometer for say Brandy Lake. That's a threefold difference <clears throat> when factoring in the island perimeters. It's a really big difference. So a frontage only policy, that is to say mandating 90 meter frontages across the township in order to manage density and crowding is not fair or equitable to the smaller lake. By definition, one new lot on a smaller lake will enjoy dramatically less water surface area for recreational use than would the same new lot on a larger lake. Now RCC deals with this challenge by linking water surface area to the number of dwellings on the lake. We call that one dwelling for every 1.6 hectares of water surface is the capacity limit. Uh, next slide. So now we're gonna look at geometry and shape of a lake and why is this important? I think it's been mentioned if you go back to your high school math that the circle is the most efficient enclosure of a given surface area. Uh, the chart shows the actual perimeter of Leonard Lake as an example. It's a 195 hectare lake and it has 13.9 kilometers of surface area. However, if Leonard Lake were a circle with the same surface area of 195 hectares, the shoreline would actually only be five kilometers. So when you're using waterfront lot frontage as a control mechanism for density, the real lake will be allowed roughly three times the number of lots that the circular lake would be afforded. So the irregularly shaped lake will endure three times the recreational usage that its sister circular lake would be afforded. Um, how is that fair or reasonable or even sensible? Now RCC corrects for this above anomaly uh, on lake geometry and lake shape. And it does so by permitting really the same number of lots for both the actual lake and the perfect circular lake. So RCC is not skewed by the geometry of the lake. That's the beauty of it. Those are the slides that I am dealing with this morning. And if there are any questions on this first set of slides, I'd be happy to answer any of them before Mr. Rochek takes over. Um, let me suggest, because it's one presentation, that you stay on, Mr. Scarrow. And if there's any questions at the end of the presentation, then um, you'll be here to answer. Okay, so Mr. Steve, you're. Sure. Thank you, there Chair. You, okay. if, uh, you could advance to slide nine, please. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you, Chair Bridgman, and good morning to committee members. Steve Rahachek, 1138 Leonard Lake Road, number two, Township of Muskoka Lakes. Um, when you, in addition to geometry, lake characteristics and topography, including narrow bays, rock shoals, islands, shallow water, and other physical features limit the usable surface area for recreational activities. A frontage only policy ignores the fact that smaller lakes have less shoreline to lake area ratio and less usable surface area than larger lakes due to these narrow bays, rock shoals, and shallow waters. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates these re realities using Leonard Lake in the, as an example. On the eastern shore of the lake, there are a number of these characteristics that restrict the use of these areas and funnel towing water activities to the main body. The South Bay is restricted by the islands and is only capable of accommodating at most two towing water craft at the same time. The main usable area for towing water activities is the main body that must accommodate the majority of lake residents. Next slide, please. If you apply a policy that allocates frontage on the larger lakes based upon the average kilometer per hectare ratios of smaller lakes previously presented, lot frontages on the larger lakes would be less than 100 feet. 
We acknowledge this is not a good policy, but neither is a frontage only policy for smaller lakes. RCC does deal directly with a number of the concerns we have raised. It adjusts for individual lake geometry and characteristics. It factors in historical small lot frontages of 100 feet because the methodology uses residential units, not frontage to calculate recreational capacity, and it factors in unusable surface area. Some will not agree with the policy, but no policy receives unanimous support. The question is, does RCC best serve the majority of small lake residents? We would say yes. After 100 years of development, planning policy needs to consider the recreational capacity of lakes and the overcrowding on smaller lakes. Next slide, please. There is a strong case for frontage only. Uh, there is a strong case that the frontage only policy for smaller lakes is not equitable, is not fair, nor do smaller lakes receive the same planning policy benefit as larger lakes. RCC in conjunction with frontage addresses many of the concerns raised today and was supported by 77% of survey respondents, the Muskoka Lake Association and Friends of Muskoka. Smaller lakes are overcrowded and RCC quantifies this fact. Dismissing the reality smaller lakes are facing suggests there would be two classes of lakes in the township as it relates to lake development capacity, larger lakes and everyone else. We do not think this is the policy intent and RCC helps to level the playing field. With RCC as a hard cap policy, there is no ambiguity as to how capacity is defined and is not open for interpretation and application as currently drafted. Our request of the committee is to reinstate RCC as a hard cap for smaller lakes. I thank you and I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, committee, any questions from anybody for these gentlemen? No? Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. All right, um, I think we're, we have Ms. Applett up next. Welcome, Ms. Applett. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can, so please, and I gather that uh, Ms. Martin Downs is following you, right? Excellent, great. Okay, great, go thank, ahead, please. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to speak to you on behalf of the Muskoka Lakes Association about the third draft of the official plan and would like to comment on seven sections. First, regarding the dark sky policies in L14, we recommend they be updated to reflect the new dark sky lighting standards that have evolved to deal with items such as light glare, clutter, and sky glow. The International Dark Sky Association describes these standards, which also provide that exterior lighting be of minimal intensity, minimally intrusive colors, and only when needed. We included suggested wording in our March submission that we recommend be included in section L14 sub E. Second, the MLA supports the submission on behalf of the Muskoka Small Lakes Coalition and other lake associations requesting that RCC be a hard cap on the creation of new lots on smaller lakes, as well as comments made on behalf of the Friends of Muskoka. We do not support the new language in E9 sub C little eight that RCC should not apply to development within the urban centers or community areas. An RCC model will help protect the safety on the water in these areas as well as fish habitat and shoreline ecology. The proposed development in Gravenhurst Muskoka Wharf is a striking example of why RCC is relevant in an urban center. 55 new boat slips are being proposed in that bay. Third, regarding the use of the bottom floor of boathouses, we request that the words to the extent permitted by law be added to E410 sub C. This will reflect the language in section 10 of regulation 161-17 to the Ontario Public Lands Act. We'd like to remind you that at the March 22nd special planning committee meeting, there was support for a small amount of recreational floor area in the bottom floor of a boathouse with a cap on both the percentage and square footage. For example, a 3000 square foot boathouse is allowed on properties with 300 feet or more frontage. With a 50% cap, 1,500 square feet of the bottom floor of the boathouse could be recreational space, which is unusual compared to the 650 square feet of living space 
that's allowed on the second floor. We'd also like to point out that damage to structures on lands subject to flooding may trigger complaints to the township. Fourth, the existing OP has guidelines to determine whether lands physically or functionally relate to the waterfront. We recommend these guidelines from the current OP be carried forward into E2 sub D of the new OP. Fifth, section E5 refers to the site alteration bylaw. It describes the purpose of the bylaw and requires it to be updated. Director Pink has explained that the site alteration bylaw does not apply to land that's being develop developed under a building permit and site plan agreement. Instead, the site plan control bylaw applies. So we request that the site plan control bylaw be added to E5 to ensure that it is also updated. We also request that patios be added to the list of structures that should be considered in the updated bylaws. Another section, E4 sub 2 sub 2 G, states that waterfront areas shall be subject to the tree preservation bylaw and site alteration bylaw. We ask that the site plan control bylaw be added. Sixth, building elevation drawings are integral to decisions on site plan control. So we recommend that E7 sub B provide that the location of buildings will be based on building elevation drawings. And finally, regarding setbacks in E4.12, the recent application for a property on Acton Island has shown that properties with two water frontages can create significant issues when they're developed. So we request that where a property has two distinct lake frontages on two sides, an equivalent setback should apply to both frontages. This will ensure that an entire building is set back appropriately from the water, not just the front side of the building. In conclusion, thank you very much for the excellent progress made in helping to ensure these policies create a sustainable future for the township. We urge committee to schedule a public meeting as soon as possible so that this OP can get well down the road during this term of council. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Eppler. Okay, so we'll hold, if anybody has any questions, let's hold them till after Ms. Martin Downs has uh, spoken to us. Welcome. I think you just Sorry, muted I lost my I lost my cursor. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay, please there's carry two, on. There's, there's two screens stuff just drives me crazy. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor. Uh, almost called you Mayor Bridgman. Sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry, Mayor Harding. Uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, members of council, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Deborah Martin Downs, uh, 1367 Breezy Point Road, Township Muskoka Lakes, and I'm here today as the president of the Muskoka Lakes Association for the next couple of weeks. Uh, with my fellow MLA directors, Ken and Susan, we have divvied up our comments on the on the draft, um, and uh, we are still digesting it. There's a lot of a lot of material there, but uh, uh, but we have a few, uh, as you've heard already, and I'm going to uh, provide a few final comments. We did provide you with a very lengthy list of suggested revisions to the plan, and we're very pleased to see that so many have been incorporated into it. We know this has been and remains, uh, I'll use Laurie's words, a gargantuan task, but the end is in sight. So let me add my thanks to the dedication you've shown to get this right. Thank you for making the environment the star of the plan and for applying uh, in this recent draft, the precautionary principle lens to all the policies in order that we do not chip away at the intent of the policy document. So what does the precautionary principle really mean? It means that when our understanding is not complete, we err on the side of caution. When we are not sure if the mitigation measures proposed will work or that the precedent set by allowing a policy variance will not open the floodgates, we choose to ask for more information or not to approve the plan as presented. I've said it before at our, the last meeting and I'll say it again, our lakes, shorelines and wildlands are finite and shared resources. At your meeting in March, I spoke of the concept of the commons, in this case being the lakes of the Muskokas. No one and everyone own them. The air and water around us though cannot be readily fenced or owned, so impacts to the commons must be prevented by different means, <clears throat> by laws or policies. Every new restriction placed on the commons will involve the infringement of what someone believes is their rights, but it's done for the greater good. So I ask the committee to remember the linkage between land use and our lakes. It's not enough to have environmental policies if the land use policies do not reflect or support them. And yes, some are becoming more restrictive, but essential to protect our commons. 
The next point I want to make uh, is a fairly brief one, but it's about the natural heritage policies. And as I've been getting back into them and, and re-reviewing, I note that the term natural heritage features and areas in the definitions has been very narrowly defined in this policy. And I wanted to also to remind council that a, a forest, a wetland or a habitat does not need to be significant as defined under the provincial policy statement to make it important to the quality of our environment and water quality. So it asks that you ensure that the definition is expanded to include those features that commonly make up the Muskoka environment, including forests and wetlands. And my final comments, I wanna focus on the provision in the plan for climate change and sustainability. The plan provides some forward thinking objectives found in the B2, B3 and B7 around sustainability and green development and climate change. And I'm gonna sound like a broken record as I've said it before, but little really has changed in the plan. This plan must be aspirational and lead the change we need to see in Muskoka. While the language in the objectives is quite clear on intent using words like require, the policy directions are less directive. They use words like encourage, consider, may, and they remain that predominant direction. And while I appreciate that they don't all apply to all app, uh, applications and that the township may not have the tools at its disposal right now, this is the only opportunity we have to say we will develop sustainable design standards, not we may. Such guidelines are essential to implement the plan. The language needs to be more committal for effective implementation, not consider, but complete, not encourage, but require. They're easy fixes, with the will of council behind it. I will remind you our climate cannot wait. Climate change action must happen now. And finally, if these, uh, if these new ways of designing and building are to be enabled, they need to be reflected or repeated in other policy sections. For example, water and wastewater servicing needs to reflect or reference water conservation measures that are introduced under sustainable development and water reuse noted under stormwater management. They're in different places and maybe someone won't go there to look. So we need to make sure that they're cross-referenced or, or repeated in different sections. We do have some other minor comments that we'll be making. Uh, they're not minor, but they're not worthy of, of taking up time at council this morning. So we will be providing a, uh, a letter with some additional suggestions in it in the coming, hopefully in the coming days. Uh, and we wanted to wait until this meeting was over to hear if there was anything else. So thank you for the opportunity to speak and I will uh, uh, finish today. Thank you, Ms. Martin Downs. Okay, uh, committee, any questions? I don't see any, so thank you both for your input. And we will now carry on with uh, Jason Siff, Bob Clark, Kevin Scott, and uh, Ali Brown, and uh, Stefan Zerbeck, uh, representing R. Muskoka, I gather from my notes. Welcome, welcome, Mr. Siff. Good morning, committee members and staff. Thank you for the time to speak here today. Uh, my name is Jason Siff, 3687 Highway 118 West, Port Carling, POB, POB 1J0. I would like to also thank uh, both committee members and staff and the planners at Meridian for all their efforts put into this so far. Uh, it would, uh, it's been a huge job, we know. I will say it's been quite the scramble with all the meetings the last week on the site alteration and tree preservation bylaw that reading through the entire OP draft and preparing for today has been hard. Uh, which is five business days, but I'm sure we can all relate. First off, from my first review, I really do not think this draft is quite ready for the public yet. If you think it is, I urge committee members to ask Meridian to produce some kind of simplified document so the public can try to decipher what this means and how this will affect them and their property rights. I struggle to understand all of the implications of this plan myself. I'm still trying to figure it out. In the last meeting, we kept hearing, let's take this to the public and see what they think. So I hope that it is decided today that an open house and a statutory public meeting is needed and will be held in a way that allows for lots of discussion and conversation. Currently, our planners are going through this document and we'll be we will be drafting a summary of sorts. But again, five days was not adequate amount of time to do this. Um, I would ask in the future, if we could have these documents a little sooner and a little more time to look at them, that would be appreciated. I would like to make a few comments. Uh, water access lots. Uh, it was good to see that the need for mainland landings 
has been massaged um, and replaced with some other options. However, I think the lease that the town is going to require Marina to sign sounds very complicated, both for the Marina and the owner. Um, I would ask, could we maybe have a draft lease um, or idea of what, um, what a Marina would need to sign along with the owners? Um, and then we could also check that with marinas to, to comment on. Um, undersized lots. Um, in E4.5.2, undersized lots are now being defined as 200 feet or less. Um, this is new, I believe. I don't remember seeing this come up in past drafts or conversations. My understanding was that undersized lots were always classified as 100 feet or less. Steep lots. Uh, E4.5. Dot four, another new item that has been added to the draft is blasting on steep lots. There are many steep lots in Muskoka and blasting can be done in responsible ways. If we remove blasting on steeper lots, the built form of the structure will be much taller and not set down in the land as it could be. Lower level boathouses. This language is an improvement from the past draft and is encouraging to see. We look forward to hearing more on this topic in the future. I want to stress for all councillors, this is something property owners want. They want to enjoy the lake. This is why they come to Muskoka. And if they can sit on their dock or on top of their boathouses, why can't they sit inside their boathouse out of the elements? Recreational carrying capacity. RCC uses a complicated method to limit the number of waterfront lots based on the lake surface area. It's questionable at best, particularly on lakes where there's public boat access. I'm, it might work on smaller lakes where there's only one boat per dock, but most cottages on the large lakes have a number of boats. We understand that on the large three lakes, it will only maybe be used in special days. Boating on the large lakes is rarely contained to the bay you, are, you park your boat in. We believe RCC policies on category one lakes should be removed from this plan entirely. I can see from today's delegations, this is a sticking point for all. So I would request that Meridian releases some kind of report or study on this topic. Site plan control. I think we can all agree that site plan control is an important topic. A, sorry, important tool that can help to catch issues before they happen, but it should only be used when the proposed development is large enough to need it, not minor square hundred foot additions. Why is it needed for a boathouse? Why is it needed for an addition? The current rules that around what triggers site plan are strong enough. At a minimum, all the verbiage should be removed from the OP and drafted into the future bylaws. The proposed official plan is more complex and contains many more interrelated policies and cross references between different sections of the current official plan. Creating a more detailed and complex plan will pose a greater challenge for property owners and contractors to understand the applicable policies and more assistance from township planning staff will be required. An increased number of amendments will also be required to the official plan because of the amount of detail and complexity included in the policies. Simple language is not being used. Due to time constraints, I was only able to review section E in regards to the waterfront lots and we'll review the balance of the plan in the coming weeks. I would like to make one comment though. We all too often focus on waterfront in Muskoka and not the local population. We need to be drafting more on affordable housing and infrastructure that supports the locals and keeps Muskoka running all year long. We desperately need more homes in Port Carling and Bala. We are all struggling to find staff and the consensus from most are that they have to live too far away from these towns and the cost of transportation is becoming too high. We need to be putting more real work into this and this is the time to do it. In conclusion, I will again ask that councillors ask Meridian for a list of changes from the old OP to the new to simplify the review process for everyone. Property owners won't read a 200 plus page document and we need this- Mr. Well Sift, you need, you need to wrap up. Thank you for my time today. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Pink, could you, I just think we need to clarify the 200 uh, foot uh, lot compared to the 100 foot. So please go ahead. Uh, through you. Okay. Uh, currently, uh, the current official plan does identify small lots as those under 200 feet or under one acre. Uh, has some uh, directional policies, predominantly that uh, items such as sport courts are not permitted, and that is implemented currently in our zoning bylaw. The 100 foot, uh, 15,000 square foot limitation that was referred to, that is an existing lot of record criteria that is also in our zoning bylaw, and that dictates when. Uh, building permits or when a property is a building lot or not a building lot. So there is that current distinction uh, in the current official plan and zoning bylaw. Hope that helps clarify. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Clark, or uh, count, uh, sorry, count, uh, <clears throat> let's save any thoughts we have to the end of this presentation by our Muskoka, if we could please. So Mr. Clark,
Uh, you're on mute, Bob, if you are speaking. You've got your camera off, so I can't tell. Okay, I've unmuted and I'm actually trying to get my camera on with no luck. Here we oh, go. Okay, so in, oh. all right, we're winning. <laughs> okay, go for it. Go, okay, go I'll be brief. Um, again, thank you to everybody for their hard work on this uh, official plan. I think, you know, obviously tons of passion, tons of input, and uh, uh, everybody has recognized uh, more than a ton of hours. So, uh, Appreciate everybody who's had input, including all groups. Um, there's some repetition, but I'll be quick. Um, you know, I think it'd be helpful to have a summary of changes, especially for going out to the public uh, versus the current OP. So I think we've talked about that. Our Muskoka will be presenting a letter to you regarding um, our five to six main topics that we're looking for a change on. Uh, we'll have that to you shortly. Um, the OP needs to go through a series of in-person public meetings and uh, not be passed prior to the next election until that happens. If it happens prior and we're able to do that, when people are up here in the summer uh, in the next couple of months, then um, let's go with democracy. But uh, uh, if we're going to try and do this in the fall, I don't think uh, we're going to have enough people around to deal with it um, that have valuable input. Um, our Muskoka has significant human uh, resources and we have planners and lawyers on staff to look at these things. Five days just is not enough time to respond properly to a, a document that's 200 and something pages long uh, without a, without a uh, summary of changes. Um, I want, you know, I put down here that I reiterate that there's far too many numbers in this document, but I actually applaud you for removing a lot of numbers in this document and, uh, moving them to bylaw um, discussions where they can be vetted and they can be, um, you know, uh, justified. So I think that's a great move. Um, just the caution is if we take a look at how much time uh, the site alteration tree preservation bylaws took, uh, I don't know how many bylaws come out of an official plan, but I'm sure it's more than two. And it took three to four meetings to get through those two bylaws. So uh, I expect we've got a long journey ahead of us. Um, I would ask that a budget be put together encompassing the cost of the taxpayer over the next 12, 24, 36 months to implement the increase in oversight. It should include human resources, capital expenditures and all related costs to implementing this OP. I think it's going to be a massive undertaking and require a ton of staff, buildings and capex. Um, I'd also like to know from Mr. Pink and it's not a today question. It's a today question without a today answer. Um, what is the expected number of annual site plans out of this adoption and the estimated time or at least the committed time from the township uh, to approve a site plan. Um, you know, there's numbers being bantered around somewhere between eight and 10 times what we currently have. Um, my last comments are a little more off the cuff. Um, I would just say there were some opening comments from our first speaker about advertising, et cetera. I'd just say, be careful about throwing uh, rocks at glass houses. I think uh, if we start looking at everybody's social media and advertising, um, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, <laughs> latitude being provided um, that maybe should be clamped down on and we would applaud that as well. Um, so please look at your own information. Um, the only other thing that I'll say is on RCC, um, I was involved in an in-depth discussion with that being part of the planning committee. Um, it probably does apply to small lakes. Uh, you know, it requires some tweaking it isn't science-based. There's variables that need to be put into that formula, such as boat speed that we're guessing at. Um, I don't think anybody on a small lake knows the average speed for what period of time a boat is running around the lake. Um, it was deemed not to work on large lakes. So organizations have said, well, let's chop large lakes into small bays and into small areas. That is not the intent of why recreational carrying capacity was put together. So I applaud Mr. Siff's idea of why don't we actually get Meridian, although they may be conflicted um, with Mr. Diamond, who created recreational carrying capacity, um, about responding to it uh, or putting a plan together. But again, we got to use the data. And um, 
and that data needs to be vetted. So um, as a tool, I think it works. We're talking about lake plans, causation studies, and lake frontage and site plans, all being part of creating a lot on a small lake and then adding RCC. That's five things to control the uh, creation of a lot on a small lake. I'd say that's a lot of oversight and it would be impossible to create a small or create a lot on a small lake. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. And um, I don't believe Mr. Diamond created RCC. He's done a lot of work in that area, but I, I think we should give the credit to whoever whoever actually created it. And I can't remember who it is. Anyway, thank you. And um, I have Kevin Scott next, Mr. Scott. We don't see Mr. Scott here. All right, well then let's go to Ms. Brown. Welcome, Ms. Brown. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you just fine. So please go ahead. Wonderful. Um, I don't want to be repetitive and I echo Jason and Bob's points, but I'll just read a few paragraphs that I have drafted. Um, due to timing constraints and so many other items on this previous week's agenda, it has been hard to undertake a satisfactory and detailed review of the draft plan and additional information and material provided. A 30 page memorandum and the 257 page proposed draft three official plan is a substantial amount of information to process and decipher. Our comments from our March 21st, 2022 letter still stand in regards to the draft official plan. To allow sufficient time to revise the proposed changes, we request a concise document that clearly outlines the changes that have been made within draft three official plan be provided well in advance of the statutory open house and public meeting of the uh, in advance of the dates. Having the memorandum alongside the draft three official plan has led to a con to confusion a lot and a lot more questioning on our end. As mentioned in the staff report, we agree that committee should concur that a statutory open house and public meeting be scheduled and we urge you to host these in person as restrictions province wide have opened up. We believe these in person meetings are needed to allow for discernment within the draft three official plan so that the best plan for the businesses and residents alike can be made. With some tweaking to the recommendations, we think a balanced and fair solution can be achieved. We know that all parties who have spoken and continue to add input to this process have a passion for Muskoka. Our common love of Muskoka should unite us. The official plan should be a guideline for the bylaws and be clear and concise. The proposed official plans inclu includes many new concepts and imposes many new restrictions that are not directed by the district plan or provincial policy, for example, new lot creation restricted, restricted by causation studies, increased area and frontage requirements, developed area limits, etc. The proposed draft three official plan is substantially similar to the draft two official plan. It is unclear how the existing plan that was seen to be pretty good has evolved to the current draft that is more complex, complicated and restrictive in some areas. As asked in our last letter, have private planning consultants who work in the township been contacted for help and input. The township should be using groups and resources within the community. The cumulative impact of these draft official plan changes will greatly affect the development rights on all properties. We urge you to consider making the official plan as simple as possible, which we have seen in some areas. Leave all the numbers and details to be worked out within the bylaws as you have done for recreational floor area in section E410. Um, Let's make the document and process user-friendly so property owners and contractors can reference it with ease. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Um, I believe our next speaker is Mr. Zerbach. Welcome, Stefan. Hi, good morning, Madam Chair. Um, I don't wanna jump the line. Although uh, Planscape is representing our Muskoka, I'm here today uh, taking on um, a, a delegation from Melissa Winch. It's a separate group of waterfront individuals. So I know there's a number of people in front of me. I, I just don't want to jump the line. I'm, I'm at your service here if you want me to sit back. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I, I'm, I don't, um, I think you're fine next, but let's, let, let's see if there's any questions about, from our Muskoka first, from our councillors. Any questions at all? No. 
Okay, because I don't see Kevin Scott still, right? I believe he was listed on here. So, so um, we will come back to him if he appears later. We don't want to negate him completely. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, Armaskoka. And so, Mr. Zerbach, um, we're going to get through everybody this morning, certainly on this list. So why don't you just uh, carry on right now? Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, so I'm Stefan Sherback, Planscape, Inc., 104 Kimberly Avenue, Bracebridge. Um, we have also been retained by a second large group of private waterfront landowners uh, who have had some recent experience navigating the planning and building uh, program within the township. The same group has been actively participating in this process, and you may recall other presentations or submissions through their lawyers, uh, Adriana Pilkington or Melissa Winch from Castles, Brock and Blackwell. This landowner group has uh, mainly scoped their concerns regarding the basic land use permissions, number and size of structures on waterfront properties, in particular boathouses. This group is pleased to see a positive step uh, forward by including OP policies that permit accessory recreational floor area within the first story of a boathouse. Of course, we all realize that the devil is in the details, but the group believes that there needs to be further clarification and discussion on these new policy directions. The boathouse, as we all can appreciate, has evolved over the last hundred years. And unfortunately, the current zoning bylaw structure has created what many have called the wedding cake or rectangular tiered structure. Our clients believe that there should be some flexibility, including the addition of specific policy tests or perhaps architectural permissions to be included within the official plan to permit or consider unique situations or even small variances to specific numbers contained in the official plan. As we know, official plans should by nature allow flexibility and in certain circumstances, again, provided there are a number of clear tests to be reviewed against under certain planning situations. Numbers uh, do not work township wide as every lot is unique. Rigid official plan policies uh, will only extend what is currently an extremely long planning and building process in your municipality. Currently, the plan program can take anywhere from eight months to a year before an applicant can apply for a building permit. Many of these new OP policies will only serve to extend this timeline. As an example, requiring a site plan process to include legal provisions such as limiting the use of a structure on both upper and lower floors or what can be stored inside of a building or structure, etc., may not be appropriate or even permitted in accordance with the requirements of Section 41 of the Planning Act. Clouding the title of a property uh, for these reasons uh, in, in our, our um, clients' minds is not appropriate in these circumstances. The new official plan makes specific references to further ex extend and expand the use of site plan agreements, site alteration, vegetation removal, et cetera. A predictable, efficient, and consolidated planning process could resolve a number of these issues before we get bogged down into the details of how each of these bylaws work in concert with another. Serious consideration should be given to include enabling policies to allow other planning options, other planning tools open for future discussions. In an effort to keep this uh, presentation short, uh, just a big thank you for providing the public with many opportunities to address council uh, during this interesting process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zerbach. Um, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I do have a question for Mr. Sherback. Um, I was a bit confused. I didn't see your name on the list and you said you represented a group of people. Could you just be a little more specific who or what group? You didn't name the group. Just, just, I just so I can tie it in with other correspondence we may have. Thank you. Mr. Zerback? Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so on the uh, delegation list, there's Melissa Winch from Castles. Uh, she has represented a number of private individuals. It's not a formal group. There are a number of private individuals that we have been retained um, uh, individually. Their issues are collective. And um, I, I mean, I, I'd be happy to put them in a list when we provide our written correspondence, but uh, just to ensure that, you know, we, we, we are included through Melissa Winch and um, uh, representing these individuals. No, I understand now. It's that that group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Councillor Hayes. Um, thank you. And through you, I guess this is to staff. 
um, second story boathouses with uh, accommodations. The MNRF went around at one point and uh, looked at leasing or whatever it was that they did some years ago. And I'm just wondering if we're looking at allowing habitable space on the lower level, how this would affect um, what they did back then. And if this is something that they would have to go around and renegotiate with the owners. And I'm not sure what it is. And I'm looking for an answer from staff before we make a final decision on this. Thank you. Let me ask Mr. Pink if he needs to do a little research and come back to us. Mr. Pink. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we may uh, have to do a bit more research into that matter, but my understanding is currently any habitable use of boathouse in the second story still requires uh, MNRF uh, land use uh, permit or lease of the uh, lands or uh, acquisition of the lake bed. And I believe if that's uh, transferred to the first story as well, um, then that uh, same principle would apply those same requirements. Okay, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you uh, to the chair. Uh, if we're allowing uh, half of space in the lower level and there's flooding like we've had and that, uh, are, are we then uh, responsible for that because we've allowed it? And that right now, I believe it's just storage area in, in the lower level and that, but you start putting living rooms and everything like that, who would be responsible? I know it did have insurance and I can't believe insurance companies would even insure them, but I, I've just asked a uh, question. Thank you. Um, could I suggest that that staff gets back to us with that answer when we when we discuss this, because it obviously is going to be one of the things on our list, Councillor Edwards. So I know Mr. Pink's taking note of that. So we'll get that answer. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Zerbeck. Uh, I believe our next speaker is Miss uh, Miss Lindell. Welcome, Miss Miss Lindell. Good morning. Um, thank you, Chair Bridgman. My name is Liz Lundell, and I live here round at forty one eighty two Muskoka Road one sixty nine P zero B one J zero Port Carling, of course. Um, thank you to committee and staff and consultants for all of your diligent work. I've enjoyed being a part of the working group. Uh, first, I support this draft's overarching goal of keeping the environment front and center because future decision makers need clear policy to protect our waters that form the basis of Muskoka's great appeal and sustainable economy. The lakes and rivers are public assets for all who visit, live, and work here. I also applaud the new focus on cumulative impacts, especially in light of climate change. The strengthened policies on water watershed planning, stormwater management, and increased sizes for new log creation on the current draft are very good. Scientific study into lake biology shows that freshwater lakes have warmed six times faster in the past 25 years than in prior periods, and that ice forming lakes are warming twice as fast as oceans. Significant changes are already underway. I strongly support putting policy in place now to retain trees, vegetation, limit blasting, reduce erosion, prevent runoff and nutrients from hazardous lakes, and to plan for resiliency in the years ahead. I feel that the precautionary approach in the current draft is exactly what is needed. And I believe that in order for all of us to enjoy living, working, and relaxing in Muskoka, there have to be certain limits on individual actions, prioritizing public interest over short-term self-interest. Ownership of shoreline property in particular is a privilege that carries responsibility. Owning like front land could be compared to owning a car or truck. One has the right to purchase a vehicle, to use it and to sell it, but that doesn't give an owner carte blanche to use it however they wish. We accept all kinds of restrictions from multiple levels of government on car use, where it can be driven, where it can be parked, how many people it accommodates, speeds, emission tests, and so on. We accept those limits on automobile use because they are in the public interest for the benefit of society as a whole. Recreational carrying capacity provides a comparable opportunity for social benefit by applying limits on new law creation, but only if it is applied on a consistent basis. You have heard several requests from small lake associations. 
During public workshops, most people asked for clear and consistent rules. 77% of respondents to the second draft survey supported hard caps on the creation of new lots and commercial expansion on lakes where RCC has been exceeded. They asked for a cap. Providing simply a guideline for consideration is not likely to hold up to appeal. In 2016, regarding an Osler Lake Severance in Seguin Township that exceeded RCC, the OMB found that, to quote, RCC figures are not arbitrary. They are based on a standard calculation that has been developed out of years of research and experimentation. The RCC policies are applied consistently throughout the township and are used by planning authorities in other jurisdictions. So the RCC formula adequately addresses tourist commercial uses as well as public boat launches and waterfront landings by including an allocation for them on the finite surface of a lake. On the smallest lakes in our township, there still exist 147 vacant and developable lots. If just those vacant lots are developed, that alone increases the number of properties by a full 56%. On the lakes over capacity that are greater than 30 hectares, development of vacant lots, which may proceed as of right, will increase the number of properties by 15%. And the Meridian March 12th report is clear that these lakes are already significantly over capacity. Recreational carrying capacity needs to be a non-discretionary hard cap if it is to be effective and avoid challenges at the land tribunal. Seguin and Dysart are two municipalities with clear non-discretionary language. The Canadian Encyclopedia cautions us that, quote, an absolute right over property would result in the dissolution of society. Landowners should not be permitted to pollute the air and water because this would lessen the enjoyment and property values of adjacent owners, and because of the moral obligation to pass on to succeeding generations a habitable planet. Property rights may therefore be modified to respond to new threats to the environment. Society will always face the dilemma of how to combine the efficient use of resources with effective regulation in the interests of all. Again, thank you for your ongoing efforts to create policy that ensures long-term sustainability in the public interest. Thank you, Ms. Lindell. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to um, Ms. Lindell. Uh, Liz, we did exchange um, uh, emails uh, a few weeks ago pertaining to the government's restrictions or requirements for uh, boathouses. And um, I wonder if you wanted at this time uh, bring that topic up to, uh, to for the information of committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Roberts. Um, I believe Ms. Eplett addressed that in her address. There was a mention of um, limiting uh, main floor boathouse use to the extent permissible by law. And she mentioned the Ontario Regulation 161, I believe it's dash 17. It would be section 10 um, that applies to uh, single story boathouse use. Thank you. That's what I wanted to make sure was re-emphasized. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Now I don't see anybody else. So thank you, Ms. Lindell. Thank you. Okay, and um, I see Mr. Richards is here. So we'll just go back and and uh, hear him, Paul. I think he's disappeared from my screen at this point. Oh, there he is. Yeah, okay. Paul, can you hear me? Okay, Paul, if you can't get on in the next couple of seconds, I'm just going to um, go to someone else so we can keep this moving, but I won't forget about you. All right, Mr. Uh, Mr. Tryon. You're not seeing him either. Okay, well then let's move next to Mr. Noonan and um, Ms. McIntosh, Leonard Lake Cottagers Association. Can you hear me all right? I can. Welcome. All right. 
Firstly, uh, it's Debbie McIntosh. Thank you for doing that. Before I get into my five minutes, uh, Debbie McIntosh will be speaking uh, by herself to herself and her property she owns. She will not be representing the LLCA. Oh, thank you. I, thank you very much for that clarification. Okay, please go ahead. Okay. Good morning, Chair Bridgman, Todd Noonan, 1080 Glen Gordon Road, Bracebridge, Ontario, speaking on behalf of Leonard Lake Cottagers Association. Firstly, I want to don't want to repeat, but uh, the undersized lots and the new definition, uh, very impactful on Leonard Lake. Uh, what was previously written as affecting 2% of owners of Leonard Lake under the new ruling under 200 feet it increases to around 70% of the owners. At best, this would be untimely and cumbersome for the process and redevelopment on these properties. I think this needs further review. As for RCC, I support the request for further data from Meridian to support the RCC model, model that is proposed. Uh, today, I'll, I will deal mainly with the Leonard Lake plan and try to deal with facts only. A water quality impact assessment was completed in 2017 on Leonard Lake and it proved to not adversely impact, development would not adversely impact the water quality of Leonard Lake. This report was peer reviewed and accepted by Township of Muskoka Lakes and LPAT. In 2020, a Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association created a lake plan. It was submitted for inclusion in the draft OP. It included items related to land use policy. Of the original draft E6.1C of draft OP 2021, now referred to as E10.1C of draft OP3, states land use aspects of lake plans shall be incorporated in the official plan by way of an official plan amendment when the township is satisfied that a robust public consultation process has been followed throughout the preparation of the lake plan and the land is supported by a majority of the affected property owners. This position of majority support for lake plan is contained within the district of Muskoka OP as well. Using the data submitted, 167 lots and the vote results, 76 yes in support of the lake plan, as submitted, a majority was never achieved as required by E10.1C. I now mention submitted as within E10.34 Leonard Lake, editing has occurred without an open form and discussion on restrictions being imposed that changed the original submission from the LLSA, mainly E10.3.4C1, E10.34C2, E3.10.2 is now restriction was never discussed or voted on by owners of Leonard Lake. E10.34 reference boathouses shall not be permitted has now been replaced with E10.3.4D. I can only believe the no boathouse restriction was removed after a recent survey showed only 34% support in favor of this restriction. The addressed editing would impose restrictions on lots on Leonard Lake unseen on any other lake within the township of Muskoka Lakes. Draft OP E43 categorizes 97 lakes and rivers in the township of Muskoka Lakes into three categories. Leonard Lake is category two medium-sized lake. Four lake plans were submitted for inclusion in the OP by category two lakes as per E4.3. None of the other three were edited by staff or their representatives due to include such restrictions as in Leonard Lake being an E10.341C1, E10.34D. We are left wondering, Chair, why Leonard Lake, the most recent WQIA supported development? Why were land use policies within the Leonard Lake plan included? As per E10.1C, a majority was never achieved for inclusion as indicated. Why was, why was staff edited the submission to be so restrictive? Why only Leonard Lake? I'm, acting, I'm asking this committee or this council to recognize the injustice being imposed on owners of Leonard Lake and remove any and all land use policies contained in the lake plan for Leonard Lake for these reasons. Non-compliance with the terms for land use policy inclusion as identified in E10.1C, editing by staff and or their representative to greatly change a submitted plan causing excessive controls on owners of Leonard Lake. Inconsistently and finally, application of land use policy being imposed on owners of Leonard Lake the only lake in the township of Muskoka Lakes. Thank you. Good 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Noonan. Um, I'm going to ask that you submit a written submission because it's very hard for me particularly to follow a lot of that when it's just numbers going okay. at me. <laughs> I so, apologize for that. I tried to identify them early, but given the five minutes, it's would take enough time explaining them. Well, to be honest with you, something written, we can go back and reference. It's really helpful to yeah. have that. So if you could do that, that would be terrific. Thank you. I will do that. And I apologize. Had it been an open forum, I'd be able to hand it to you at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, well, someday we'll get back there. Yeah, Thanks. maybe. <laughs> okay, Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. Uh, yes, I too uh, would be would welcome uh, something in writing from uh, this group of uh, property owners from Leonard Lake. Um, there were uh, a few stats in there that um, didn't match up with the numbers that I did because I created the first uh, uh, property list for Leonard Lake. So I just want to know how they came about and all the points that Mr. Noonan made. Um, to Mr. Noonan, um, trying to be open-minded, I did contact many, many um, cottagers and property owners, property owners specifically around the lake. And um, all that I contacted were not aware of your, um, your group. So um, I don't know how much you, uh, you know, you, you represent. I do know that the, uh, the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association have been very open and transparent. In fact, the survey that was done, um, if my memory serves me correctly, they had uh, seven video or, or uh, Zoom calls. Um, they contacted everyone. They had a mailing list. They had a follow-up for the ones that did not attend uh, and see to get their input. So it was very open and transparent. And so I really look forward to the numbers that you have presented. Uh, or statistics so I can go through them and um, and confirm them. Thank you. So Mr. Noonan, maybe you could also include the process you took in terms okay. of contacting people and that just so that I have all that information, that would be helpful. Can, can I respond to the numbers? Uh, well, the num I don't think so because we're not in a debate here. No, um, no, I was just going to say that they were, they're the ones from the lake plan. They were used from everything that's been submitted and on okay. file now. Well, I suggest you put that in your written, um, your written um, input too. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very much. Some Plavendo, Madam Chair. I'd also be interested in hearing from uh, this group, um, the, their membership um, and, and how a voting member uh, is recognized. So uh, all attempts to understand this have, have not been communicated. So for open transparency, I think this group should do it as well. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure Mr. Noonan has heard you. So that's great. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Noonan. And uh, I am going to go to um, Ms. McIntosh Mac now, who is speaking on her own. Ms. McIntosh. Okay. Okay, we have a big we have a, a real echo coming back. Have you got another device going? Like a phone, like something else? Is that okay? I think we're okay now. No, we're not. You you have something else in the room that is is um, about now. No. Um have you got another computer going? There was, the but I think they've turned it off. Now we're good, I think. Okay. No. Um, okay, let's let's start and I'll let Did you know go? if we're if we're getting echoes now. Okay. So um, my name's Debbie McIntosh. I live at 1080 Glen Gordon Road. Um, I live on Leonard Lake, and I just wanted to give a little bit of a background. Um, so my situation, I wanted to give you a background on my situation um, regarding my comments on draft three. We went through a severance process, ultimately resulting in a favorable LPAT decision, OPA 
50, A51. Um, now our OPA51 forms part of the draft three, um, part M special site policies, M10. So there are a number of restrictions, parameters, and requirements in OPA51 that are registered on our property. Our consultants entered into settlement negotiations with the township representatives hired by the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association. One of the parameters that was identified in the settlement agreement and is included in OPA 51, it states that the maximum ground floor area for a dwelling shall not exceed 325 meters squared. This is an important to note that this reference is made to ground floor area, which is footprint. The Leonard Lake plan developed through the Leonard Lake Cottage or Stakeholders Association included a development policy that states a dwelling shall not exceed 325 meters squared on a lot. This requirement is more restrictive as it refers to the size of the dwelling, not the ground floor area or footprint. Somehow this requirement became even more restrictive in the OP draft three section E10 3.4 CI. Now it states that the maximum gross floor area for dwellings shall be 325 meters squared. Um, Mr. Pink confirmed that ground floor area refers to footprint and gross floor area refers to the cumulative size of all stories, of all dwellings. This requirement imposes a significant disadvantage to large waterfront lots. This requirement would place an allowable lot coverage to under 2% on R2 lots that have shorelines of one over a thousand feet and the other over 500 feet. In addition, any development on lots on Leonard Lake with a footprint of a building of 150 meters squared and two stories would be unable to expand their existing cottage or add a sleeping cabin, even if they were under the 8% lot area. So my question is, if, a lake, if the lake plan section E10 of the OP is informed by a lake plan, how did the wording change from a dwelling shall not exceed 325 to maximum gross floor areas for dwellings shall be 325 meters squared? This is a major and significant departure from what participants in the Leonard Lake consultation process voted on in the lake plan. Why does the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association through the development of the lake plan get another opportunity to impose even further restrictions on our property? There are no other properties on Leonard Lake that would have a lot coverage restriction to under 2%. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. McIntosh. Any comments, councillors? Okay, thank you for your input. I am going to uh, call a quick quick comfort break right now. You were at 10.30. So let's take um, a 12 minute break and come back at 20 to 11.
Thank you. Okay, committee, if I could get you all back, please. So I'm Sorry. going to I'm going to go to Mr. Tryon in a second, but um, Mr. Richards, I know I know sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get the uh, electronics going. So I'm going to call on you next, um, just as a heads up. Can you hear me? I can, but I'm just actually are, you're here, Mr. Tryon. I'm going to actually let Mr. Richards go first then because we've actually got him and then you can come on next. I, okay. I know some people, sometimes it's easier. Technology is easier for some than others, I think is what I'm trying to say. So let me make sure, um, Mr. Richards, we've got uh, quorum again. We do. Okay, so Mr. Richards, please go ahead. And you if you've got, if, if yes, I can. And yes. I, if you've yes. got uh, video, that'd be great. Chairperson, staff, yes, counselors, thank you for this opportunity to be with you. I'm going to touch on a few different subjects, but we'll try to be brief and hold most of my comments until future meetings. First, I would like to address the issue of virtual meetings. Two weeks ago, I attended a Blue Mountain Council meeting held in the rotunda of the municipal building in Thornbury. The meeting was open to all. We were asked to wear masks and participation was encouraged. It is very difficult to encourage participation in a virtual meeting. I would strongly recommend that future meetings involving critical issues should be held in the community center, just down the steps from the township municipal building a site that would provide ample space with safe social distancing. Reviewing the pages from the OP that I printed from page 227 to 166 under growth management, I was surprised to see under focus of growth, no less than 70% of expected year round dwellings should be directed to the urban centers of Port Carling and, and, their, and uh, Bella and their vitality and regeneration should be promoted. But further on the OP, we will be talking about the Manette development, which would far outstrip any growth in Port Carling or Bell. Surely this deserves mention. Similarly, under seasonal population growth, the projected growth is 1,790 people. But in Manette alone, we're talking about 4,000 or more people. The expensive, supposedly expert 2014 study provided figures that were dangerously hyperinflated. And I say dangerous because they were used and quoted frequently in planning decisions. Population estimates haven't not been working. In pages 59 and 60 regarding effective water bodies for water quality evaluation in section eight of E4-232, Manette Bay, which has the dubious honor of being number one or two of the most polluted areas in Muskoka, surely should be emphasized and most in need of frequent sampling. How can that possibly be left off? On pages 85 and 86, there's a great section on Skelton Lake. I believe that the consultants and council have now all agreed that any pit quarry development within two kilometers of the lakeshore would compromise the purity of Skelton Lake and also threatened Lake Grosso and the other big lakes with mercury contamination. Page 92, use is permitted in a commercial resort from F32A. The use of resort commercial accommodation unit as a year round or seasonal dwelling should not be permitted. There is no mention of an enforcement process or penalty, but units have been and will continue to be sold as residential. This issue must be addressed or the regulations will continue to be ignored. There are examples, I've got, I've got literature showing that condo developments are being sold as residential. I couldn't end without some reference to our neighbor legacy and the astonishing desecration of 17 acres with 43 houses under construction. They have been working on this development since 2017 
And although there is nearly always someone working on something, most of the units are far completed and the development is a total blot on the scope. I've been told there are about 14 houses approved for accommodation and there are about three or four families living there from time to time on the premises. There is no swimming pool. There are no amenities. And after several truckloads of sand were dumped to create a beach last summer, much of it washed into the lake after a big rainstorm. To suggest a legacy as a resort would be very misleading. Virtually all of the trees were cut down. We were told that this had to be done for efficient construction. However, take a look at the Muskoka record, please. Third, uh, Muskoka Resort, Muskoka Resort. 3876 Highway 118 West in Port Carling on Lake Joseph, where they chose not to remove the trees, but still have reasonably high density and it's beautiful and a real credit to the developer. It would perhaps be valuable for all of our councillors and planners to visit these two sites and deserve that it can be done. Muskoka can be kept beautiful. Thanks for your attention and thanks for your dedicated effort to protect and preserve the remaining beauty in Muskoka. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Any uh, questions, uh, committee? Okay, then thank you. Uh, we're going to move on then to Mr. Tryon now, please. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you, just your address and please carry on. Bill Tryon, 141 Maverly Crescent, Scarborough, Ontario, Leonard Lake, uh, seasonal resident. Good morning. And through you, Chair Bridgman, I recognize everyone's efforts towards amending TML's OP. I have a pecuniary interest in the OP. I am not a land use planner or a lawyer and would be wiser to obtain sound legal advice prior to speaking further to draft three of the OP here and after called OP3. Most concerns I previously submitted to the township remain outstanding. RCC for Leonard Lake was addressed at LPAT 18044. RCC equals a tool, one tool in a TML's toolbox. OP3's E4.6 still refers to section E4.5.5, where E4.5.5 does not otherwise exist in the OP. OP changes are extensive, which have not been fully processed by me for in-depth comment. Wildland fires, township roads and active transportation, pedestrian and cycling routes, trails, affordable housing and parkland initiatives are very helpful. Today provides an opportunity to step back and comment anew about the process. Under item 10, land use planning from the Ontario Municipal Councillor's Guide, the Clean Water Act ensures Communities protect their drinking water by developing watershed-based source protection plants that are locally driven and based on science. Drinking water threats identified in the Government of Ontario guide include agricultural, fertilizer, pesticide, road salt, de-icing, materials, sewage, runoff, stormwater, but not boathouses, social values, lot coverage, or setbacks. I submit late plans may best identify and recommend mitigation from threats to water quality, including, but not include, exclusive to, use of fertilizers, pesticides, road salt, the icer, sewage runoff, stormwater, not boathouses, lot coverage, or setbacks. Under E4.2.3 of TML's OP on causation studies, please consider Penn Lake's causation study final report where Hessel looked at possible causes for 2017 blue-green algal bloom in Penn Lake, where the most likely cause of the bloom was a combination of climate factors, including a period of prolonged high air temperature and low wind speed. Recommendations included stewardship and educational programs, reduced disturbance related to site alteration, as well as the use of fertilizers, et cetera, improved stormwater management to reduce runoff. Penn Lake survey asked, have there been any changes to shoreline uses? One comment on boathouses, large, quote, large docks and boathouses in abundance. In abundance, unquote. Per Leonard Lake's stakeholders, Lake Plan, it states according to the 2017 Shoreline Land Survey, Leonard Lake's boathouse totals include two one slip, one two slip, and eight on land boathouses. The district's same 2017 shoreline maps for Leonard Lake qualified itself by mentioning the information contained herein may be erroneous, inaccurate, or misleading. I can confirm Leonard Lake has at 
as at December, December 2020 and June 2022, at least 22 overwater boathouses and 17 on land boathouses using the definition, definitions found in bylaw 2014-14. Pessel and the district did not recommend further restrictions on docks and boathouses for Penn Lake, but suggested social values of the lake may be protected through more restrictive policies in the lake plan providing the majority of stakeholders support a revised plan for Penn Lake. Changes could be made at the local level. To date, Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association's lake plan lacks majority support. If a lake plan forms part of an OP, property owners may require OPAs on land use matters that previously may not have required a zoning bylaw amendment or committee of adjustment approval process. A lake plan may require amendment to achieve majority support. Leonard Lake had a supportive lake plan in 2008 but lacks majority support for their 2020 lake plan now. In 2013, TML's OP made provision for lake plans but did not incorporate LLSA's 2008 lake plan into current plan. Under section B, 4.4 of TML's 2013 consolidated OP, it states, a lake can be changed in character category as identified in section B.9 following the submission of a satisfactory lake plan and an amendment to this plan. The wording in this provision must be included in the next OP. This concept encourages property owners to apply good lake stewardship with the reward of less restrictive zoning bylaws on built form lot coverage and setback requirements, not greater restrictions sought in LLSA's plan. Direct quotations from Leonard Lake survey did not include conservation blocks, 20 or 30 meter setbacks, 8% lot coverage, new tourist commercial uses or separation of existing uses on two, two lots. A reader of Lake Plan must question if these issues were identified in the Lake Survey where other issues were routinely made. How did the Mr. Mr. Tri Mr. Tri the excuse plan? me, Mr. Tryon, you you're at your five minutes, so please just wrap it up. All right, thank you, Chair. Uh, I reject the wording in OP3 as it relates to undersized lots, lake plants, and setback requirements requirements for structures, including leaching beds. Uh, TML must invoke subsection 692 of the Planning Act to mitigate costs. Resulting okay, Mr. Tryon, you need to wrap it up. Yes, it, resulting from all new restrictions imposed by OP3, and I apologize. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, oh, Council oh, may, sorry, may I? May I? Um, sorry, Chair. Um, yes. I, I just wanted to say if no, 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 Mr. Mr. Tryon, you're you're far over five minutes, and we're not letting anybody go over that today. I'm sorry, um, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. That was a lot of information in five minutes. Uh, so I, I hope uh, Mr. Tryon has provided a uh, a copy to the clerk so that I can look at, re read it in detail and uh, slow it down to my, my brain speed. Sorry for that, Bill, but I'd like to see what you have. Thank you. Well, to that point, you could certainly include what you have not been able to say. If you would send us your written comments, please, Mr. Tryon. Uh Thank you, Chair. It's just the fact that property owners should include a Muskoka no. area Indigenous leadership. No, table. no, no, you may not. Thank you. Okay. All right. So next on our list is uh, John Roberts. Um, Mr. Roberts? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, do you have video? I do, but I'm not sure if it's on or whether I can turn it on. Well, if, in, not, in, if, if not, I can make my present. Oh. Yeah, let's not, let, let's not spend a lot of time finding your video then. Please just go ahead. Okay, my name is John Roberts. I currently live at 31-1158 Shea Road in Utterson, P0B1M0. Uh, I'm the president of the Three Mile Lake Association and will be speaking on their behalf. Um, thanks for the opportunity to urge the planning committee to recommend retaining the hard cap on the recreational carrying capacity in your operating plan. I will focus my remarks on the proliferation of watercraft, particularly on the smaller lakes in the township. I've owned my cottage on Three Mile for 39 years, 
And the most striking change I've seen is the number of watercraft on our lake. In a survey we conducted with our members in 2019, we asked, what type of boats do you own? The results, 65% canoe, 60% kayak, 46% power boat over 50 horsepower, 38% paddle boat, 29% paddle board, 26% sea dew or jet ski, 21% rowboat, 20% power boat under 10 horsepower, and 19% on power boat 21 to 50 horsepower. If you take a boat cruise on a boat cruise on Three Mile Lake, it is amazing to see the variety and number of watercraft. It is not unusual to see at one dock a power boat, several sea dews, a canoe, a kayak, a wakeboard, or a paddle or a paddleboard. Although we are the fifth largest lake in the township by area, and the fourth largest when you measure the hectares of surface area per kilometer of perimeter, it is sometimes difficult for my granddaughters to find enough room on the lake to safely water ski. Times have certainly changed. A hard cap on recreational carrying capacity is protection against future development on Three Mile Lake and the further crowding that would occur. Hopefully the committee agrees with our viewpoint Thanks for the opportunity to make our case. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Uh, committee, any questions? Nope. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we're on now to Mr. Greenham. Mr. Greenham, welcome. Okay. Start video. We will start video. Okay. Can you hear me? I can. Do you have video, Mr. Greenham? Uh, well, let me see. I'm trying to. <laughs> Doesn't look like it. I don't know. Okay. I, no, I can no. see you guys, but uh, anyway, I'll just go on. Please do. Go ahead. Okay. My name is Mark Greenham. I reside at 16 Waverly Drive in Guelph, Ontario. Our family cottage is located at 1126 Leonard Lake Road 2. My family is one of the original cottagers on Leonard Lake. My grandparents built 67 years ago, back in 1955, the same year that our beloved Santa's Village opened. My family has been a staunch supporter of the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association since its inception in 2004, and are proud of the invaluable work they have done to protect the future of Leonard Lake for the next generation of cottagers. We feel that the LLSA's diligent work to embed our lake plan into the Township of Muskoka Lake's new official plan is of the utmost importance to protect the lake from overdevelopment and continued water quality deterioration. We also feel that the LLSA has gone out of its way to operate with full disclosure and transparency to convey its goals and key agenda to all lake residents and has been extremely successful in gaining the support of a strong majority of Leonard Lake property owners. Unfortunately, Leonard Lake is now considered a blue-green algae lake by the Ministry of the Environment. As such, it is incredibly sensitive to further development. Several world-leading scientific experts in this field have deemed the lake to be considerably overdeveloped already. Now, given that the bulk of the lake was subdivided in the early 1950s and 60s, when development restrictions were almost non-existent, this is not surprising. We feel that it is crucial that the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association Lake Plan is embedded into the new Township of Muskoka Lake's official plan if we have any chance of saving the lake and preserving or hopefully improving water quality and overall lake health in the years to come. News of the creation of another group calling themselves the Leonard Lake Cottages Association is very troubling as we have never heard of this organization before now. No literature or other information has ever been forwarded to my family. It would appear that this group is purely the invention of the small group of real estate investors who are actively developing the North Shore of Leonard Lake to be used as a tool to purely undermine the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association and cause confusion within the Township of Muskoka Lakes. My family fully supports the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association and all of its activities and wants to see 
the Leonard Lake Plan presented by the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association incorporated into the new Township of Muskoka Lakes official plan going forward. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Greenham. Any questions, committee? None? Okay, thank you. Then I believe our next speaker is Ms. Ms. Brinch. My apologies if I haven't said that properly. There you are, welcome. That's fine, thank you. <clears throat> My husband and I have owned uh, property on Leonard Lake, 1168 Leonard Lake Road number one for 30 years. And I have also been involved with the water quality testing for the last five years. The LLSA or the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association has for years acted as a forum for concerns raised by residents. Members of the board volunteer countless hours addressing those concerns, conducting surveys to solicit opinions and feedback, and conveying a wide range of information to all residents as well as to uh, municipal and district authorities. The LLSA has been a major supporter of water quality initiatives, providing resources and encouragement to participate not only in organizations such as the MLA and the Watershed Council Algae Project, but also in additional studies with scientists to try to understand conditions unique to our lake. The Eyes on the Lake program where cottagers are encouraged to be observant and report any suspected algae blooms has been successful. We have been able to quickly report observations to the ministry for confirmation and at the same time collect important data to better understand changing conditions in our lake water. We have also participated in conferences sponsored by the CMC, that is the Cyanobacteria Monitoring Collaborative, where experts from several countries present new research, discuss mitigation measures, and share helpful information on toxic algae blooms. Does the size of a lake matter? We know that climate change threatens water quality in all our lakes, but that this threat is even greater for smaller lakes. Smaller lakes tend to be shallow, uh, shallower and thus contain a smaller volume of water. The lower volume of water has less capacity to withstand adverse changes in climate. To quote uh, a speaker from the CMC conference this spring, and I quote, shallower lakes with higher surface areas located in developed areas which raise nutrient inputs are most vulnerable to increasing cyanobacterial blooms, end quote. Policies that are based on one size fits all solutions may not be appropriate for lakes of different sizes. The most vital concern raised by our cottagers is maintaining good water quality. Without that, our shared resource, our lake, becomes a shared liability. What good is a lake where residents have to be concerned about toxins in the water? We have entrusted our lake association, the LLSA, to emphasize lake health and we have entrusted municipal and district leaders to ensure policies that protect lake health. That is what will sustain land values and economic viability. We expect our leaders to accept the responsibility of implementing policies that have not only short-term benefits, but also ensure long-term solutions. And that responsibility extends to recognition that smaller lakes deserve policies that address their unique nature and unique vulnerabilities. They re require additional protection from the impact of climate change. What can we learn from other jurisdictions that have faced similar problems with lake quality? Lake Simcoe, large amounts of money have been spent for over um, a decade. Can we avoid a similar situation? It is much easier to treat water quality issues when they are still small and manageable rather than delaying and then facing a much larger, complex and costlier problem. Scientists state, if phosphorus is minimized, you will get a lower biomass of blooms and less toxin produced. The LLSA and volunteers are doing everything we can to not only avoid blooms, but also to keep algae blooms small, intermittent and short-lived. All of us have a lot to lose if we don't succeed. We need the help of every resident on the lake, as well as your help. We are trying a multi-pronged approach, trying to understand internal loading of phosphorus from the sediment, limiting uh, nutrients in runoff, as well as encouraging efficient septic systems. 
This is why our proposed policy around enhanced septic systems is so important and why it is important to include it in the official plan. We ask that you acknowledge the unique challenges that smaller lakes face. We support our lake plan and we request that you acknowledge our concerns and recommendations. In order for us to achieve our goals to preserve the water quality of Leonard Lake, we request that our stated policies be made part of the TML's official plan. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, committee, any comments? All right, so thank you for your input. And I see uh, uh, Chriselle has uh, anticipated me. Thank you very much. Uh, we are on to our two minutes in terms of delegations now. Uh, so uh, we are going to start with um, Mr. Byrne, uh, Don Byrne. Mr. Byrne, welcome. Yes, sorry, I'm just working on my video here. Okay. There we go. Okay, thank you. So please, just your name and address and you have two minutes. Go ahead, please. My name is Don Byrne. I'm, I live at 223 Herb Street West in Waterloo. I have a cottage on Brandy Lake on Philmar Lane and I'm the president of the Brandy Lake Association. I'd like to start off by uh, thanking planning staff and, and council and, and, and this committee for the work that they've done in embedding our lake plan into the draft three of the, the official plan. This is something which we very much appreciate and we feel that this is an important step for us to meet our goal of enhancing the uh, lake health of, of Brandy Lake. Um, I also, as, as many of the other speakers, I, 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 I uh, would prefer the RCC was a hard cap. I'm not gonna talk more about that specifically. I'm gonna talk a bit about the RCC as it currently appears in, in draft three of the OP. And I'll, I'll talk very briefly about two points that, uh, that I have some concerns about. First of all, I, I feel there's a lack of clarity on the role of RCC in draft three of the OP. Um, for example, section nine, so section E9 parts E and F do not provide clear guidance as to what will and will not be allowed for properties on lakes that do not meet the, the current RCC criteria. And I, th I think this lack of clarity will result in a lot of applications for development, which will, which perhaps should not have, have, uh, have gone forward. My, my second concern is that section E9 treats RC as, as, as a yes, no entity. It's you, you, you meet it or you don't. And, and, and there's a, a listing of lakes that, that don't meet it, but no indication of how close they are to that or, or probably more importantly, how far away they are from meeting the 1.6. I, I think there, there needs to be a recognition that for some lakes, the, the uh, development with some controls is probably an appropriate measure if, if the RCC is, is close to 1.6 or 1.5 as an example, then you can see that development in, in a very controlled way could still be appropriate. For lakes um, and brandies is, is one example that, that, are, that have very low values of RCC, it should effectively, there should effectively be a, a hard cap on, on a lower number. Miss, Mr. Burn, Mr. Burn, you're at your two minutes. Okay, thank you. Oh, could and you all please this. wrap it up? And I, I think that we, we need to consider that some, some lakes simply have too low an RCC and they should not have development. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, committee, questions? All right, thank you for that. And we're going to move on now to Joanne uh, Rusnell. Welcome, Ms. Rusnell. Thank you, um, Chairperson, and thank you, Committee, for hearing my remarks. Um, so I'll, I'll try and stay within my two minutes. I live in Toronto at Two Olympus Avenue, uh, but I've been a cottager at Leonard Lake since I was 12 years old, since 1967. My parents bought a cottage and then I, uh, I bought it from them and I own an island, 1L3 on Leonard Lake. I wanted to, um, to talk to you today to say that I support the submissions of the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association regarding um, incorporating the, uh, the lake plan that they have developed um, into the official plan. I've been a member of the LLSA since, it, uh, since inception. In fact, I was one of the um, the founders of the association 
And I can vouch, I'm no longer on the executive, but I can vouch that throughout the, um, the time that there's been an association since I think it was 2008, the association has always been a consultative, open, transparent um, organization focused on the long-term health and viability of Leonard Lake. So I was disturbed to hear that there was a, um, a group purporting to represent uh, cottagers and residents of Leonard Lake, calling itself the Cottagers Association, uh, represented by Mr. Noonan earlier, who have never reached out to anyone to say what their agenda is, uh, what they're hoping to accomplish. There's no um, mention of them online. We, we don't really know what they are, but we do know that Mr. Noonan is a developer who came onto the lake in order to uh, subdivide a large portion of shoreline, <clears throat> excuse me, and develop it um, into uh, into uh, sub properties for profit. So um, to me, that does not speak of someone who actually has the interests of the lake at heart. So I just want to conclude by saying that, you know, I think the um, council should recognize the LSA as a credible, uh, transparent, organization working in the best interests of Leonard Lake and its water quality. And um, I I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Rusnall, you're at your two minutes. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. Anyway, uh, any, any, <laughs> any questions, committee? We did get the gist of your, of your uh, comments. Okay. okay, we are now going to move on to Bruce McNeely. Mr. McNeely, welcome. Yes. Chair Bridgman, uh, you can see me and good to go. Uh, you're all set to go. Just your address too, please. Okay. Um, my name is Bruce McNeely. I reside in the township at 8-1163 Leonard Lake Road 1. That's Milford Bay P1LOM5. I'm a director of the LLSA. Thank you for permitting me to speak to the meeting. Uh, my remarks are limited to the Leonard Lake draft lake plan. I strongly approve of the lake plan and the incorporation of the plans, planning policies into the official plan. I refer to a consul, uh, the consultation report prepared by LLSA dated January 14, 2021, that sets out all the steps taken uh, in developing the lake plan. And I believe uh, council members have uh, access to a copy of that. Uh, I'm just going to summarize the process that was followed. LLSA identified 97% of the lakefront, uh, waterfront, island, backlot, and, wa and uh, watershed property owners, the eligible, I call them the eligible voting pool, through current municipal and provincial records. A wide-ranging survey was prepared by, prepared by LSA and sent to the property owners. It was posted on the website. All survey responses were reviewed by an independent volunteer who complied a summary of the survey results. Uh, the LLSA board mem members did not have access to the raw data. A draft lake plan was prepared by LLSA on the basis of the feedback uh, from the voting pool property owners, and the plan was distributed by email, uh, mail as required to all the stakeholders uh, known to LLSA, included, um, that's 97% of the people. Feedback and votes on the lake plan were received via six separate two-hour Zoom meetings which with full dialogue back and forth and one conference call held in November 2020. With follow-up emails by the president to each property owner who had not participated in the Zoom call and encouraged, encouraged them to inform themselves, give a call, uh, get, have their questions answered. Um, uh, as a result of that feedback, minor but appropriate changes were made to the draft plan that was released, that was submitted to the township. These are the results. 62% of all property owners responded. 50.3%. Mr. McNeely, you are at uh, two minutes. So would you wrap it up, please? Sure. Basically, uh, we, uh, uh, of the people who voted and chose to vote and participate, we had 94% who voted in favor of the lake plan and only 6% who said no. So the lake plan should be adopted by the township. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor or count, um, committee, any questions? Okay, thank you. So we're going to go on to Jana Corrigan now. Good morning. I'm Jana Corrigan, owner of 1186 Leonard Lake Road 2. 
I've been coming to Leonard Lake for 42 years. I was fortunate to be a guest of friends for a good number of those years and then decided to rent for longer durations. Finally, three years ago, my spouse and I were able to purchase a property and we became members of the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association. We have found the organization to be professional and yes, transparent. We appreciate the information that is forthcoming and available on the website or by simply reaching out to one of the directors. Two years ago, donations totaling 5,000 funded the purchase of water testing equipment and recently, a further 5,500 raised is ensuring the viability of intensive water testing program. To me, this is a good indication of the support this association does have. As no, today's the first I've heard of another association. I have never been approached or provided any information, an invitation to join a mission statement, nothing. I endorse the Lake Plan put forth by the LLSA and sincerely hope it makes its way into the official plan. I thank you for your hard work and for hearing my comments today. Thank you, Ms. Corrigan. Uh, committee, no comments? Okay, then thank you. We are going to move on to uh, Nancy Braun. Ms. Braun? Hi there. I'm just trying to start the video. It's saying I can't because the host is disabled at one second. <laughs> did we do that? <laughs> I don't think we did that. Um, okay, now I can. There, there you go. Okay, welcome. Uh, thanks very much. I know you've heard from so many people on Leonard Lake. I'll try to be brief. Um, but I do think that the lake does have some very unique characteristics, which are important in looking at development applications. It is landlocked. It has a very low flushing rate, um, probably less than 20% a year. And so if we do have problems, they're not easily resolved because of the low flushing. Uh, we have had a few incidents of blue-green algae, as I think you're aware. The district has identified Leonard Lake as very vulnerable from a water quality perspective, hence the causation study that's underway. Um, the district's plan does talk about the resilience of a water body being important, its ability to bounce back, its um, ability to adapt to change, and I think that it is not very resilient because of those factors. I do support the LSA, LLSA's plans to use the 8% cap on lot coverage and also to limit no new lots. They did engage scientists from elsewhere in the country who did say that given these algae blooms and the characteristics of the lake, they do feel that no lots should be permitted, new lots on the lake. I also support the need to protect the wetlands. I know that Ms. Uh, Martin Downs commented, it shouldn't just be significant wetlands, it should be all wetlands that we are trying to protect. Um, I also echo the uh, comment that I've never heard of the Leonard Lake Cottagers Association. I'm not sure if it's primarily Mr. Noonan and Ms. McIntosh and people who are friends of theirs who support their plans for development or what they are all about, but I do look forward to getting a better understanding of who they are, who they represent, what they have done to engage cottagers because We've been here for 24 years and never have heard of them. Um, and the LSA, as uh, people have said, have gone above and beyond to try to reach everybody as far as going even to municipal records to reach out to people they've never heard from. Everything's online, very transparent, lots of Zoom calls, lots of opportunity to participate, including them reaching out to the uh, Mr. Noonan and Ms. McIntosh and their association. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, committee, any questions? All right, I think we're on to um, Rob Liebetter. Mr. Liebetter? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Okay, I think Welcome. I'm Welcome. Yeah, you're um, here, and just your address too, please. Okay, my name is Rob Liebetter, 1128 Leonard Lake Road 2. I've been coming to this lake for more than 40 years, and 11 years ago we've moved here full-time. I'm a self-confessed environmentalist, and I'm speaking on behalf of Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association, supporting wholeheartedly their lake plan. Having seen firsthand the changes in lake quality over these years, I'm worried that it has the potential to get even worse. You know, over the most of the previous delegations, I was doubting the relevance of my pre presentation, but after the Noon and Macintosh nonsense, I believe it has great relevance. I'm concerned that what we have on Leonard Lake essentially is a battle between for-profit developers and those who are concerned about long-term viability of the lake. 
This is why we come here. Developers will come and go and leave behind a lake quality that will undoubtedly decline more rapidly. And they, after they've changed it forever, all in the aim of profit, after development, there's no going back. You cannot undo development. By far, the majority of Leonard Lake cottages have taken a sustainable approach on how they use the lake. We all know that's what's needed. What we need is to get ahead of the desire for profit with regulations based on the science of RCC. The information is out there and has been proven in so many cases. This needs to be enforced before it's too late. We all know that we are way over capacity on Leonard. In a world where climate change is an undeniable problem, it is being ignored. Further development on this lake is just one more change in the wrong direction that we can affect here by stopping it in its tracks. Previously, the committee failed to stop subdividing of a large track of land on the shoreline because your budget wouldn't stretch to a long needle battle. Let's not allow big money this time to control what is going to happen to this lake. Let's do the right thing this time and adopt a plan that really is sustainable, not for what is good for people's pockets. I would ask the committee, finally, members, to take your decision as if your family had owned a cottage on Leonard Lake for a generation. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, comments? Committee? Oh, okay. Thank you. And uh, we're going to move on to Monique Newman now. Or Adam Newman. <laughs> yes, uh, Madam Chair, it's it's Adam Newman. So I'm I'm uh, Monique Newman's husband. We, we jointly own uh, a property on Leonard Lake, 1130 Glen Gordon Road. We reside in Oakville, Ontario, 274 William Street. And I, like many others, just want to uh, speak to the um, the Leonard Lake uh, plan and its uh, inclusion in the official plan and the support of that, and really just uh, uh, about the objections that have been raised. Uh, we've been on the lake since 2004, so I'm not uh, quite in the same camp as some others, but we do uh, pride the uh, the lake is, is sacred, um, and uh, we've been members of the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association since its inception, and I am a former director of the association. The plan is, or the lake uh, association's its primary purpose has always been the health of the lake, first and foremost. It's been properly constituted, well-governed, in my opinion, including open and transparent uh, approach taken throughout, including AGMs, regular mailings and dock drops, has and continues to represent the majority of the re residents of the lake. There's been significant investment and work done by the Lake Association over these years, including water studies and ongoing water testing, septic education, and lake health education, surveys and awareness, all with a deep concern from the ongoing health of the lake. And fundamentally, as residents of Leonard Lake and longstanding members and supporters of the Lake Association, we place the health of the lake above anything else, even if it could be perceived to have an impact on property values. So my ask of the committee is in considering the objections raised today, in particular that of the Leonard Lake Cottagers Association, that they understand how that association was constituted who it represents, who are its supporters, and what are its ultimate motives in considering its objections. That's what I wanted to say, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Comments at all, committee? Uh, Councilor Zavitz. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, <laughs> this isn't delicate because we're here in the public. Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want to sit here and listen to the R. Muskoka complain about the MLA or vice versa. I mean, we are as a group an entity to acknowledge all special interest groups. Um, and I hope we don't have to listen to much more of this one side versus the other. Thank you. Okay, that wasn't directed at anyone. So we'll just carry on, Councillor Zavitz. Um, Andrea Frey. Hello, I'm here. Good morning, Ms. Frey. There I am. Hi, um, Madam Chair, Mayor, Committee. 
Thank you for uh, offering us this opportunity. I'm Andrea Fry. I'm chair of the Cardwell Lake Cottagers Association, and I'm a resident of Montreal, Quebec, H8S2V7. I've been going to the Cardwell Lake since I was five days old. So our, our membership includes all, all of the cottage owners on Cardwell Lake, as well as other lake users. We are a newly formed uh, organization and we're well into the process of creating a lake plan, albeit too late for inclusion in the official plan at this time. We have completed a survey which had an excellent response rate and there is much common ground between the members, few. <laughs> and as such, I feel confident in our ability to convey the wishes of our membership. I'm here to comment on the third draft of the official plan and I can say representing a population on a very remote undeveloped category three lake that we are pleased to see the addition of E4.3 item G under regulations based on lake category. Although some terms in the clause are vague, we very much agree with it in principle. We thank you both for your work on the document and in particular to your attention to our participation in the process. We will be submitting further comments in writing for your consideration. Once again, thank you all. Thank you, Ms. Frey. Committee, comments? All right, then we are on to uh, Gary Littern, Mr. Littern. Yeah, for clarity, it's, it's Lintern, like an intern with an L at the front. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm at, uh, I may live at uh, 211 Pape in Avenue in Toronto, but my cottage is 1314 Leonard Lake Road 2. Um, I want to actually start this by, by saying uh, thank you for letting me speak uh, and thanking the planning department. I've had the pleasure of dealing with them over the last couple of years, and I trust their stewardship of the lake. I think that's important that everybody continue to recognize that. I purchased my Leonard Lake cottage two years ago. I was spent 20, 25 years in Huntsville on one of the bigger lakes. And I was looking for a small jewel, right? I was looking for something that was smaller, that had a natural shoreline where the majority of people who live on the lake or cottage on the lake were in agreement about the health of the lake. Um, it's, it's, a, it's rare in Muskoka now. It's very hard to find what you've got on Leonard Lake and it's worth protecting. What I left behind was the impact of, of overdevelopment, of soft language in bylaws, of soft language in guidelines and, and, and uh, operating plans or official plans. And when you encourage people, instead of telling them, um, you get all kinds of mess. And in this case, in the lake I was on, the mess was next door and all around the lake, boathouses, uh, man-made beaches, pushing out shoreline and paying fines because there was enough money to do so. So I didn't move to Leonard Lake for that to happen again, that's why I'm speaking today. It should be noted too that when I sold my property, it was decreased in price. The property value went down by $200,000 due to the overdevelopment next door. And that should be noted that anyone who wants to throw a boathouse on a lake that's actually natural is making a mistake. Uh, I think we should all enjoy the freedom to develop our properties within guidelines. And I don't think that's a big ask. I don't think we should have the freedom to erase the shoreline put up structures that don't fit, um, cause erosion and decrease water quality. That, that's not the freedom that impacts all of us. So my ask of you is very, very simple. Um, I'm speaking because I purchased here for what it is today. And I think his, historically what it has always been. Um, and I, I up bid to get oh, that. Mr. 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 Lantern, please. It's two minutes, so I'll wrap okay. it up. So wrap it up. Leonard Lake is not Lake Muskoka. If I'd wanted big and overdeveloped, I'd be on Lake Muskoka. I'm on Leonard Lake. Please incorporate the Leonard Lake Association uh, lake plan into your, your official plan, and I think you'd be well served to do so. Thank you. Thanks thank for your you. time. Okay, thank you. Committee, any comments? Uh, all right. Eric Morgan. me and hear me now i can see you and hear you so please you have two minutes okay. mr morgan go ahead thank you very much uh 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Chair Richman, uh, for the opportunity to speak. And uh, thank you very much for the great work that all township staff and council members are doing, which is greatly appreciated. I'm Eric Morgan, a cottage owner at 1133 Leonard Lake Road 1, obviously at Leonard Lake. And I speak for myself as a member of the association, LLSA, and uh, a concerned uh, cottager uh, in the lake. I strongly support the plan presented by LLSA. The Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association represent the great majority of cottage owners with 105 paying members out of 167 properties around this small lake where members pay a due, uh, dues every year to contribute to the work that the association does on behalf of cottage owners for the preservation of the quarter quality through ongoing testing and information, the preservation of the character of the lake and the environment, and representing the majority of property owners on matters such as the uh, OP plan now in front of council. As part of the process to provide input to the OP plan, uh, the process requested that encourage property, own, uh, property owners to provide input. The association engaged in an open, active, and transparent process to seek input from lake, lake property owners that could be reached. Not only paying members, but all uh, lake owners, uh, uh, inviting them to participate. And uh, of that process, 81 Leonard Lake Cottage owners of 167 properties participated in the hardcore consultation process and provided input, which in any consult by any consultation standard is extremely high. And of those 94% approved the overall recommendations made uh, by the uh, LLSA uh, as input to the plan. As I understand it, the purpose of the plan, uh, the Mr. OP plan. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Morgan, you are at your two minutes. Okay. Well, so I want to. I want to thank. I want to th thank uh, uh, Council, uh, uh, and I hope that uh, you will uh, look carefully and uh, accept the recommendations of the as association uh, with regards to this beautiful lake. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Edwards. Councillor Edwards, you don't have a video and we can't hear you. We can see you now. Can we unmute him? Um, I there think you go. that's got it there. Yes. Somebody's playing games with me here. <laughs> but anyway. We, we were uh, trying it, to help you, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if Mr. Morgan could send me that information, I would be uh, pleased to look at it. And that all, all the uh, numbers of, of the like, it seems like a large number are with the Leonard Lake Stakeholders Association. And I'd just like to know how many. Thank you. Okay. I'm sure he will do that. All I right. will certainly do that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Um, all right, our last person to speak is uh, Laurie Simon. Good morning. Welcome, Mr. Simon. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairman Bridg Bridgman, Councillors and staff. My name is Laurie Simon, 1523 Fish Hatchery Road, Skelton Lake, Township of Muskoka Lakes. I'm a director with the Skelton Lake Cottagers Organization. I am representing the SCLO and its board of directors to affirm that the SCLO endorses fully the presentations made by the delegates from the Muskoka Small Lakes Coalition and support their position on recreational carrying capacity. We'd like to address the recreational carrying capacity, which is one approach within the township's policy alternatives that could help effectively address the concerns of overdevelopment. It is something that is proven and provides an objective look at a lake based on a criteria that acknowledges there are limits to capacity on a lake. First and foremost, if a lake is deemed to have exceeded its capacity, one questions whether adding a toolbox to allow further new lot development makes any sense. And especially when there's a listing of potential choices that provides no guidance or how to apply them. This is ensured death by a thousand cuts. This toolbox approach allows individuals and commercial enterprises to further exploit the lake and increase the usage of the resource, 
Its impact is to allow a few to benefit at the expense of the majority, the existing much larger user base. By its very nature, this approach runs contrary to the whole idea of RCC, its intent, and sets the OPP, oh, sorry, OP up to fail. In conclusion, we ask for hard caps on new lot creation for all lakes that have exceeded their RCC. Only then can we protect the resources for future generations and protect the property value for all existing owners of these lakes. And then you can be true to the very first statement of our vision statement, the township of Muskoka Lakes is known for its natural beauty and must protect its environment from overdevelopment. The SCLO applauds the vision and objectives, objectives of the new OP and will work to support the township to make it a document that is impactful in maintaining the vision. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Simon. Comments committee? Okay. All right, thank you. So that, that concludes our delegates this morning. Um, so now I would like to call on Mr. McDonald to just give us a brief summary. Um, and Mr. McDonald, we, uh, we really concentrated on RCC and boathouses, I, I think. So I wonder if you would like to give us a quick update on, on uh, where you went with this to prepare the third draft. Great, uh, thanks very much uh, Chair Bridgman for the opportunity to uh, meet with this committee today to discuss the official plan. Um, as uh, the committee appreciates, and I think many of the deputants also appreciate, uh, considerable time and effort has gone into preparing uh, this current draft. And it was decided that we would prepare a very comprehensive uh, summary of all of the changes made to that draft in that memorandum document. I think there's 125 changes in there uh, we're pretty happy with uh, with how we're presenting it, I guess, if I can put it that way. Uh, in preparing the draft, we certainly uh, took into account all of the uh, submissions received, and uh, we made an effort to include a list of all those submissions in our memorandum um, so that it was clear to all that we did review uh, that information and did consider it uh, uh, in preparing the updated uh, draft going forward. In addition, uh, this draft also implements the, uh, the, uh, the direction received uh, from this committee uh, in March uh, respecting a number of the bigger picture issues that we're talking about today, such as recreational carrying capacity, uh, the use of the bottom floor of boathouses and, and other things. Um, so those uh, discussions were already held um, and we are implementing them as, as uh, we, uh, we saw uh, as, as, as direct as directed by this committee uh, moving forward. Um, the plan is uh, always a work in progress until it's finished. Um, and so we do anticipate there, there will be other additional written submissions made uh, after this meeting and certainly um, uh, in advance of and following future meetings. We're, all, we're always prepared at looking at how to improve the official plan to make sure it properly reflects uh, the vision of this committee and, and council moving forward. Uh, but we also want to make sure that it represents good planning and is reasonable and balanced as well. Uh, I think we're very close, if not there, at this point with uh, this draft uh, going forward. Um, we're very pleased to talk about any component uh, of the document uh, moving forward. Um, there are a number of changes made, of course, uh, in the document. Uh, they are listed in our memorandum. Um, and one suggestion uh, we have in terms of expediting and perhaps moving forward the discussion is to perhaps focus on those things of interest to the committee uh, rather than me spending an hour or two going through 125 changes in my memorandum and, and explaining all of that in some detail. Uh, very much happy to talk about anything. Uh, we do have uh, the remainder of this session today uh, and other sessions are planned. Uh, I think the key ask of uh, the planning department and ourselves is direction from this committee on whether, uh, whether and when uh, a public open house and public meeting should be held. And we've suggested the first and second weeks of August for those two meetings, uh, or alternatively, those meetings could be held uh, sometime in uh, September. Uh, decision also is needed on whether the meetings are virtual, in person, or in some other format. Uh, and Mr. Pinkin's report has identified a potential constraint to having a hybrid meeting. 
So that's something that needs to be uh, discussed and, and embedded as well. Uh, so that's what we're looking for from this committee is direction on how to proceed. And we're in your hands, uh, Chair Bridgman, on how you wish to do that. So Mr. McDonald, just in terms of timing, um, I was, uh, I guess my thoughts went to where we end up during this these meetings on whether we will be proceeding to a public meeting. Are you, I don't think you're looking for confirmation today on those that first two weeks of August? Uh, not confirmation today, but we do have three sessions uh, set up with this committee to discuss the OP. So I would hope at the end of, of those sessions uh, that there would be direction provided so that we can proceed. Uh, to the next step. And uh, if that direction is not to proceed to a next step in a, in a public open house and public meeting, that's your direction. And, and, and we're happy to stop there, so to speak. Uh, if the direction is to, to prepare for a, a future open house and public meeting, we will prepare for that open house and public meeting as directed. Okay. So I, I believe just to, for committee, um, I, I am optimistic that we are going to get there during these meetings. So, um, we support those first two weeks of August, as long as we can uh, actually uh, um, achieve that goal in these next meetings. I think, I, I believe that the, the entire committee would be on board for that. So we'll go from the, I think Councillor Jaglowitz probably has a process question would be my guess. Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's not a process question, uh, but I, I appreciate speaking before you end the meeting. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, because we're talking uh, uh, environment, I would like to see uh, with we're naming lakes, all lakes in the township be named so we don't miss any. I uh, did get a uh, an email from somebody who said their lake was wasn't included. It, they they were uh, the answer was well they sorry they missed and they had added. it. But I think we should be doing all lakes. If we're talking environment first, we should be listing them all at, at, at this time and they should be in the OP. Thank you. Mr. Diamond, um, my understanding is you've, you've, you've uh, re reviewed that. Please go ahead. Yeah, I just, um, for the members of the committee and, and public attending, I've spent not less than two and a half full days trying to get the lake names correct um, you have different lake names in your zoning bylaw. Um, a lot of the lakes have different names on the provincial database than what you have. And we're really close to getting it right. Um, I, I gave Mr. Pink an example where you have, I know of three mud lakes in the township of Muskoka Lakes. Um, so we will do it, but I, we also talked about just uh, putting in a clause in the a couple of spots in the official plan. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, a couple of clauses in the uh, in the official plan that um, said that um, where lake is not named uh, or identified in the plan, that um, the fo the following policies would apply. So, in the event that we don't actually catch a lake, um, we'll catch it through the the policy in the plan. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak briefly. Uh, I've listened to the information this morning, and, and I, I have four items that uh, uh, Mr. McDonald has presented in his summary that I just like to just raise as, as issues that I think he should reconsider. I don't think they have to be discussed today, but I want to put my stake in the ground. And the first one is that uh, recreational floor area on the lower levels of boat houses should not be permitted. The second item is that recreational carrying capacity, there should be a hard cap on small lakes. The third is that the official plan uh, should deal with the 50 foot waterfront buffer and it should not be left to the site alteration bylaw. And the reason for that is that bylaws have to conform to the official plan. And if the official plan is silent, we will see a raft of the ZBAs coming forward. I think that that's important and should be dealt with in the top level document. And the fourth item is I would like to add a new area. I believe the official plan should also deal with the first 15 feet of the waterfront referred to as the ribbon of life. 
and I should I think there should be some protection in the OP in general terms and followed through with the uh, uh, zoning bylaw. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Jagler. Well, certainly we were doing the boathouses and the RCC for, sh for sure. Um, Councillor, and I've noted the other two for our discussion later. Councillor Roberts? Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you and I will have, I'll, I'll think about what I think we should be discussing and send it to you, but I do support um, uh, the, the, the thoughts that it should be an, an, an open public meeting uh, within the a township building or within some place. It should not be on Zoom for the third, the public meeting. Um, I do also say with that is that it also has to, um, for councillors, as it does, be able to allow uh, remote um, participation as our, our bylaws state. So um, in all these, my goodness, we had so many great presenters today um, and there were a few repeats, but. I, you know, I think we should be going through that um, someone and listing out in bullet form uh, the, the, the requests and that we should be responding in some way. It's um, whether it's considered or not considered or what we're going to do with it, because people took time to, um, to give us some really good, valuable input. Um, and so uh, that's, that's about it um, that I have for now. Um, I, I do agree. Uh, and we've been saying this from the front, from, from the first for the RCC, it's so important for us to communicate change. And, um, and, and, and Mr. McDonald, you did an excellent job in your uh, memorandum, listing 123 of them, but then you, you take those, you gotta go into the site. So it is a lot of work, there wasn't a lot of time and I've got to still go through it. But I think that we need a simplified document. I think we talked, about this so much, um, as, uh, it was talked at the um, brought up at the uh, working committee about you know a lot of people don't have time to go through a big huge document and try to connect the different sections. So uh, maybe our communication officer can do this using what Mr. McDonald did, but it'll be a, a big task. But I think we owe it to our constituents. Thank you. Okay, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Mr. McDonald and uh, Mr. Diamond, uh, as well as our planning staff for all their hard work. Um, it really is a monumental task that we've been working on for uh, several years now. And uh, though the finish line seems to be in sight, there's still going to be lots of heavy lifting, I think, as we move forward here to try and uh, get to that finish line. Um, also, for all those people who delegated and spoke, thank you for uh, comments. I think I, I feel like I've had a meet and greet for a half of Leonard Lake in particular, um, and uh, uh, appreciate uh, everyone's comments. Uh, and everyone is entitled to be heard and want to hear everybody. Um, so I certainly appreciate that um, as we move forward. The one question that I'm going to ask as we talk about uh, you know virtual in person meetings or whatever, and I know the difficulty of doing a hybrid, but is there the ability to have one? per se, virtual meeting and one in-person meeting and collect the data between the two um, just to continue to solicit stuff. And as opposed to having to have the specific hybrid meeting, I think there certainly is value, if possible, as we go forward to try and look at both of those facilities. You know, it's interesting, Mr. Richards wants to meet in person face to face because it's too difficult um, to, to zoom in with us. Other people would rather sit at home and zoom in from anywhere around the world. And, and I certainly understand both sides of the equation. I, I think in the last few years of pandemic has shown us that we are even more accessible. Uh, if you remember, Zoom meetings, or not Zoom meetings, but even webcasting four years ago was not what the township of Muskoka Lakes did. So that's all new in the last uh, four years. And uh, we are certainly far more accessible uh, to our constituents, but we just want to make sure that we can make sure we appease both sides of the equation as we move forward. So Mr. McDonald, could we do, maybe I should be asking Mr. Pink, um, can we do a in-person and also do a virtual or is that workload difficult? So I can start off and perhaps Mr. Pink can uh, add to this. Uh, so according to the Planning Act, we're required to hold two statutory meetings. One is an open house and one is a public meeting. So if there was a desire to hold one 
fully virtual as we have been in the last three years. That's not a problem. That's very easy to organize. And if you want to hold one that's solely a public meeting as per it used to be before COVID times, that's, that's very possible and doable as well. Uh, I'll leave it to David and others to speak to the hybrid model and its limitations currently in the township. But if you want to do one of each kind, that is entirely possible. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pitt. Thank you, Chair, uh, through you. I, I don't have much to add to Mr. McDonald, uh, just in response to your worship, but that's certainly possible. Um, if that's the direction of the committee, we can accommodate one of each. Uh, perhaps might let the clerk comment on the um, hybrid uh, tech technological limitations, can probably speak more intelligently than I can, uh, but I think that might be a challenge in time for August. Uh, we can certainly accommodate one of each if that's the wish of committee it's going to be uh, i think uh, chair rightly said perhaps if we uh, go through these discussions over the next few days and perhaps at the conclusion um, can agree on an appropriate dates um, that might be the uh, the last thing to to discuss so um committee before i ask the clerk to chime in on hybrid because i think it i think we already know it's difficult would we be all be okay with one one virtual and and one in person i th i think our committee is fine with that so so there you go so okay all right so um anybody else want to give me their list now or would you like to send it to me i was going to say i am going to make the assumption that what came in the memorandum unless it's raised we are in agreement with that or you are in agreement with that so that we're basically only going to pull out what what we at this point want to be discussed be, before the revisions are done by mr mcdonald so so um mr mcdonald in the in the interest of getting as much time as we can i think we might be able to start on the boathouse discussion for the next 10 minutes i believe we have a hard cap of uh, noon and then we can carry on with that. And I would ask committee, if you wouldn't mind sending me your list by about eight o'clock tonight, I'm not up late at night. <laughs> I want to have the list ready for tomorrow. Um, Mayor Harding. Uh, sorry, the other one thing, I just if, as, as a list that came up and it was really interesting um, perspective, uh, I think MLA brought it up for friends of Muskoka, the dual front yards setbacks and i'm not sure whether we want to do that specifically in the official plan or this or maybe the zoning bylaw but uh, specifically on a point of land that has dual frontages um that they potentially both could be dealt with as a front yard setback i think would be an appropriate method so uh, that to me makes a lot of sense um though it's not a ton of properties we will run into problems with certain properties so i think that is um something uh to discuss uh, also madam chair appreciate we have you know nine minutes left here um my fear on boathouse discussion might be a little more than nine minutes and i would hate to start down this road or make a quick decision because i think it is significant um so uh I, I leave it in your hands what we go forward with but um anyway Boy, my crystal ball must have been really shiny if I thought we were going to finish this off in nine minutes. I thought we were just starting it, actually. <laughs> Would committee prefer just to, um, oh, Councillor Hay, I was going to say we we could actually call it a day today and we get into all the heavy stuff uh, tomorrow. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Um, that was good. There was just a couple of typos. I'll just send those in rather than uh, talking about them. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. McDonald, any further comments for today or or we'll see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning? Yeah, I, I, I have no further comments at the moment. I'm really in your hands as a committee to to respond to uh, any uh, issues you want to talk about. And uh, we're here uh, to do that tomorrow. So look forward to it. OK, so we will do that. And um, as a wrap up, I do want to thank you, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond and our planning staff. I will reiterate how much we all know how much work has gone into this. It is a great jumping off place for us for our meetings next week. And to everybody who delegated, I also want to extend a thank you and for uh, respecting the time limits. Everything moved actually faster than I than I thought it would. So th that was great. So, okay, so everyone, we're going to, I 
Wait a minute. Motion. Yeah. <laughs> Motion. Yes. Okay. Um, moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa. Oh, is she left? Okay. All right. Um, moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that the special planning committee meeting adjourn at 11:55 a.m. and the next and the next special planning uh, committee meeting will be held on Tuesday, June 21st, 2022, at 9 a.m. All in favor? Carried. That's great. And I want to thank um, Chriselle and and Lauren for expediating this meeting. Um, it's really hard to do this electronically with so many people coming in and out. So got an off, awesome team here. And thank you. So we'll see everybody tomorrow morning at nine.